at are not pointed fingers at. Kenya is not free. Mm. Kenya imeshikwa na mateka. It's under siege. Have you seen that lodge on Nanyerere Road? Very high fence, you can't even see inside. Windows up near the ceiling. Yes. Yeah. <gasps> and if you walk yeah. that midnight, you see bats the size of cows. <laughs> <laughs> and when it rains, it doesn't rain on that building. Yes. <laughs> when you're at All Saints mm. and it's raining, <laughs> it doesn't rain on that building. <laughs> <laughs> the things people will believe. Well. The city. This is the Situation Room, the home of hard hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is The Situation Room, the only way to start Today's your day. day. Yes. Wednesday. Hey, uh, hey. Wednesday. It's Wednesday? Yes, it is. Wednesday. It's, Something it's Wednesday. Uh, yes, yes, yes. This yes, mixer yes. has uh, things. It's Wednesday, it's meant. He mixer is. icon of my fate. Open Jambia word today, what could you wash a mix? Eh? Strina card. What could you wash? Wash, shake it. No sabuni. Mm. What could you wash? Open is our Edna for this week. It's called Ignatius Openje. And those are his names, by mm, the way. Mm, Don't think we're giving proper. him nicknames. Uh, uh. He's Openje. Yes, and his other name is Ignatius. Ignatius. And if you really want to make him happy, we call him Iggy. Yeah. Iggy, Iggy. Iggy, Iggy. Or Shizo, or Pizo. Ndiyo huyo, ndiyo huyo. Ndiyo yeye. Ndiyo yeye huyo. You work a live stream bus. Yes. Opizo, au jiweka live stream Opizo? <laughs> Kime umana? Ngelesha yego wakusaidi. Yego wako hapo, he's working on it. He's sorting it out. Yego wansema hapo. Anajua kuongea na hiyo. Yee, yeah, anapembeleza. Anabe, kwenda left, kwenda right. Anacheza, cheza na hiyo. Kwenda mgopa. Yee. Yeah. Yes. Siti mambo ni mga gani? Well, it rained, drizzled really. It did, eh? But eh. the thing that has now been ushered in with certainty is cold. Mm. Is, is it really cold? Co- Nani, you... <laughs> 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 this is a discussion that excludes you. It oh, is there with I'm certainty. I'm just observing this, this conversation. <laughs> yes, and I'm also observing you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, cold it is. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Wana e. you, know, Wana e. you know, people like you and are fortunate. Mm. You have an inbuilt thermostat. I do. Yes, so you <laughs> where they can. When it's cold, my it's hot. My hearth. Yes. My hearth. Your hearth. Is warm. Yeah. Hey, hey. Okay. Okay, let me wait until 10 o'clock. She is giving us half and stories. once upon a time. She was here on her. She was here? No, she was here on her. Yes. With the warm uh, <laughs> and you Ndu? Yes. How warm are you? <laughs> <clears throat> I'll have to look for a thermometer to tell you the exact number. Uh, but I'm fine, thank you. You're feeling like that. <laughs> How? You're feeling hot. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> good morning to you too. Mm. Karibu sana. Why do people say that? So, so in good a morning, meeting last week. Good morning to you too. Uh, yeah. A meeting last week. See, it's a crowd of people. You've gotten up to address the crowd. A crowd. Then you say... Or an audience, whatever. All right. Then you say, good morning, everybody. Yes. Then everybody says, good morning. Right. Then you say, good morning once again. Right. Why? Because you just said it. As no, in, no, the no, no, no. Oh, was yeah. Yeah. no, 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 no. Everybody said, you said, Not good morning, everybody, everybody. Then they say, good morning, Mr. Muga. Then you say, 
Good morning once again. No. No. You, it is because that response, is the greeting. No. The response didn't have the oomph that was necessary. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon once again. It's like almost. Yes. That's you, how you do it. Praise yes. the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord Amen. once again. Okay. Yes. Yes. That's what it is. Yes. I mean, come on. Give <laughs> it a little energy. Yeah. Adi, good morning. You can't just come say good morning. If you say, say good morning once, but then you, you have a problem. How do you just? How do you stand in front of people and just say good morning, good morning. And, then, and then you proceed. and then you continue? What, what, you what are you? Are you Some a headmaster? How about well, you follow it with how are you? As opposed to the same thing you so just you said. No, you can't ask a crowd how are you. Yes, no. you can. You're gonna say we are fine. We are quite fine. We are we quite are. well, thank you. It's the collective. It's a re <laughs> response to the greeting in concert. It's yes, fine. it's good morning. <laughs> you haven't said it. You haven't responded. Good morning once again. Good morning, you again. The response mm. of the crowd was just the same. No, no, no. Yeah, I don't know what crowd you hang out with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you. Because when I do this, I, I say, I will keep saying good morning until the entire hall That's responds. No, no, no. I've yes. been in a room. I say, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Good morning once again. Good morning. Okay. Let's all talk, right, let's everybody. Let's, let's good morning. I will keep saying good morning until I get all your attention. Eric, that's very different. I've been in a room where you're moderating and uh, you don't say it like that. How do I say what it? You, 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 you repeat because you give the reason as to why you're repeating. But this good morning once again is, is like... Part uh, one and yeah, part two of the no, same. No, no. Listen, but, uh, Ndu. Uh, Ndu has understood what we're saying. Yeah, she gets that it. disclaimer that she's just given. Mm. Said, you know, you Eric, you know, I've been in the room. <laughs> as a story, we, we, we to make a gotch. <laughs> you just but, refuse but, to but, listen to but, what I'm saying. But listen, aye, aye. as Africans, you have to say it twice. But no. You gotta say it twice. No, you don't. Right? You've gotta say it twice. If you don't get it, like the first, uh, if you don't get it the it, first time, there's a problem. Okay. Good morning. Hi, CT. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Fine, thanks. Good morning once again. <laughs> Good morning to you also. <laughs> Bonasue. Bonasue, Sarah. Amen. Yes, Bonas yes. You can't just go uh, Bonasue and move on. Si but uh, even then, and God is good. Yeah. God is good. Yeah. And that's his nature. Amen. Yes. Wow. And now what? this one is when you're saying God is good. Mm. Then you get evangelical. God is good. You see? God is good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that was my rant for the morning. <laughs> okay. Good morning. Ndu. <laughs> for the 15th time. Time. Surely. <laughs> Everybody, good morning. Open your camera, Fanya. It's on. Fanya, we are waiting for our, ah, our live stream audience is in. Good morning. Yes. Good morning once again. <laughs> <laughs> the people who are watching us on the live stream, welcome. Our Edna for this week is called Ignatius Openje. Just say hello to all of us. Sawa, sawa. Okay, salimia watu, salimia openje. Don't forget, don't forget, Yego is also here. Yego is unholding the whole thing and he's doing a good job. We are going to discuss several things. Let me tell you what we'll be discussing. At 7 a.m., we'll talk about the global and local trends on uh, ride hailing services. So you've seen that. And we were talking about it last week, City, mm. where when ride hailing uh, apps they came into the country. There was all this conversation, you know, from those who were operating taxis previously and saying, ah, these guys are coming to move hey, into man, our there was, there was a first brother. Yeah. But then we've seen the actual development and growth in this sector. But it has come with many things. It has come with questions about safety, questions about, you know, concerns, um, drivers saying, you know, we can operate like this. Uh, very many issues. We have invited Linda Ndungo, who's a country manager for Bolt Kenya, to come and have a conversation uh, with us on this particular one. And then at 8 o'clock, we are going to have a conversation about education. Kenya's education curriculum, the past, present and future. One person who was involved in the development of the CBC is Professor Charles Ocheng Ongondo. Professor Ongondo is now the CEO at the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development. So he's the boss of the curriculum development and the rollout of this curriculum. When you talk about, oh, grade sevens, are they learning? Are they not? Do you 17 subjects? Do you two subjects? The man is Professor Ongondo. He'll come at eight. Let's talk about this. And how are we preparing for that transition, particularly the junior secondary to senior secondary transition? We need to understand this clearly. When you say, now nah, we're going to group children into three STEM subjects, mm. and the other one are called what? Roots. Life. <laughs> life. <laughs> something. Life. Something. Yeah? Life. There's lifestyles. I beg. I will remember. I'll tell you just now. Professor Ongonda will come and tell us. Mm -mm. When these kids who are now in grade 8, when they finish grade 9, eh -heh, what are these pathways that they're going to be choosing? And how will they go with those pathways? 8 a.m. At 9 o'clock, we talk about... 
uh, fuel expenditure and uh, carbon emissions in the country. Peter Echesa is the founder and group CEO for a company called Borderless Trucking and Safe Truck. He'll join us at 9 o'clock for that conversation. Okay? Big one, big one. 18 minutes after 6. Uh, live stream is up. Say hello to Eric Ndu, CT, Yego, and our main Iggy, man this Iggy. week, Iggy Iggy Openje <laughs> Opesh Pesh. <laughs> Seventeen degrees and cloudy conditions in Nairobi this morning. Highs of twenty-five and lows of fifteen. It's partly cloudy at fifteen in Nakuru with highs of twenty-six, and we'll see highs of twenty-five in a mostly cloudy Nyeri at seventeen. It's thirteen and cloudy in Eldoret. Highs of twenty-six, and looking into a cloudy Mombasa twenty-seven. We'll see highs of 33. Malindi is cloudy at 28 with highs of 33. And Kisumu at 19 is clear, going to highs of 30. Kakamega mostly clear at 17 with highs of 32 day. And looking into a mostly cloudy Kampala at 20, we'll see highs of 28. And Dar es Salaam will see highs of 32. It's partly cloudy at 28. Johannesburg is clear at 19 with highs of 31. And Mogadishu going to highs of 34 today is already partly sunny at 26. It's 15 and clear in Addis Ababa with highs of 24. And we're looking into a mostly cloudy Lagos at 28 going to highs of 33. And Kinshasa will see highs of 33. It's currently cloudy at 25. Um, Wednesday afternoon is sunny in Beijing at 6 degrees, while Paris at 6 is cloudy, highs of 10 and lows of 2. And uh, London is cloudy at 6 with highs of 11. It's a cloudy evening at uh, 8 degrees in New York Tuesday. Coming into Wednesday, we'll see highs of 10 and lows of 6. Twenty after six. Zeke says, "Happy Hump Day, y'all." Um, Happy Hump Day to him. Okay. Robert Burgess says, "Good morning from Mombasa." Uh -huh. Joe Mungai um, says that he watched the interview with the intersex, and the panel was great, but when he had a few gaps here and there, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Monica Euler says, "Good morning." Good morning, Spices. Great job, and we love you all. Love you too, Monica. Rogers Nyange says, "Good morning." Uh, watching from Voy Taita. And Gore, Chamge, my beautiful people, greetings from the beautiful hills of Saboti. Uh -huh. um, Kitale says, it's really cold. The rainy season has officially started. You know me, I take this, you people's really cold with a pinch of salt. But Anne, good morning, darling. Um, Kennedy and Yonya says, good morning, guys. Hope I'm fine or, um, but of late, but mm. of, eh? all of you, but start late. Why? I don't understand what you're saying, Kennedy. But we're here. The stream. Oh, is that what you mean? The stream started late? Mm. Okay. Um, Brian Otieno says, good morning. Can they ask CT, what is freedom if a man or a woman doesn't know himself? Wow. CT, you specifically. If you don't know yourself, mm. what, what is, is freedom? freedom? That is a profound like, what is love? Uh, no, that is actually a profound <clears throat> philosophical what question. What is love? Hmm. And you know, you take the view that you'll spend the rest of your life trying to figure out who you who are. Who you are. Mm. This is mm. true. Mm. So you're never free, really. So not really, really, not okay. really. Because if you take freedom as a concept, mm. okay, and not a finite, unchanging, non-dynamic concept, then you'll have missed the point. Freedom is dynamic. Uh, mm. Yes. This is true. Okay. Ah, huh, that was deep. Wow, CT. Peter Mwauran Jerry says, good morning from Kanunga. Grace Cosmos says, good morning, my favorite spice is glued to the conversation from Doha. Um, Kennedy Wanjala says good morning from Kilifi. I like that name actually. Mm -hmm. uh, Jala. Uh, eh, where did everybody go? My finger? Okay. Onganyi Malala says good morning Team Spice. You do a commendable job. Thank you so much brother. Thanks for tuning in every morning. Luca Biero says good morning tuned in from Kayole. And the three musketeers. People who carry muskets. That's what they're known. Are you people gun wielding individuals? Yes. Okay. Uh, he's listening from Gasharage Junction in Rocker. Even okay. Zintabo says good morning to y'all. Felix Bosiri is tuning from Eldoret. And Zeke is happy to be here once again. Elvis Kibet is tuned in from Eldoret. Mm -hmm. And Sammy Lidanya says good morning, tuned in from Mazeras. Hey, Lillian is doing a yippee. She says that 102.5 is back. 
Good morning from Kenya. Okay. Um, Anne Gore has come back and she said, Chamge, Yego, and Ignatius. Good morning, my peeps. Eric, CT, Ndu, Edna. Yes, she is. We're waving at her. Uh -huh. And says, good morning to you. I can't sleep without watching your show. So now that you've started, now you'll sleep well. Oh, I mean. yeah. Openje and Yego and Mwali Mumuga and Ndu and Eric, everybody. Good morning and listening. Rhoda Wamboy says, tune in from the UK. Lamek Makua says, good morning. Simon Kwamoy says, good morning as well. Peter Monya says, good morning. Looking good in red. <laughs> Sante sana. Salimia, the hard-hitting man, Eric. Nabwana CT. Misalimiwa. Thank, Thank you so much. much. There you go. Victor Muo Musioki from Royro says, we can start our day. Yes, we can. CT Kwani, you were prepped. Um, For? You were prepped with that question, the answer? No. Okay. Tom which Randall, question, which answer? the one for... Uh, the philosophical one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Were you ready? It seems like you were ready. Like you knew what the question that was coming. This is Socrates, man. So, <laughs> got the philosopher right man. here with us. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Tommy Randall says, Ndu, did you know? Ndu, uh, did you know that you can turn off the notifications so that your audience can better to... internalize the conversations without mm -hmm. the annoying sounds? Yes, we did. But you know what, Tommy? It's intentional. The bird tweeting. Which one? Is Appendius, you don't salty? like the bird tweeting? Oh my Why goodness. are you angry this Just morning? Honest, little, what would he prefer instead? Would you like a better, a different sound? Just wants to hear your sound. Whatever. Right. So, Tommy, it's actually an <laughs> intentional sound. Keep it moving, Eric. Bali says, good morning, Team Spice. Francis Masharia is tuned in this morning. And he says, the whistle is very loud. <laughs> okay. To the watch, we, we, to to the watch, watch whistle. Everybody to is just whistle. not liking this word. It's been there for four years, but we've just realized it now. Okay. Bubble Queen, hey, I like that, is tuning from Northampton in the UK. And uh, from Nairobi, the message says, good morning. Karibu sana, everybody. Everybody, welcome. We're still in uh, the Southern African country of? We're still in the Southern, Southern African Kingdom, Baba. Kingdom. Did you say town? <laughs> it's not country. Kingdom. Kingdom. There's difference. Okay. Yes. Country mm. has president. <laughs> country has prime minister. <laughs> Kingdom has king, gotcha, monarch. Nisawa. Hmm? Nisawa. Okay. Easy. Ah, yeah. mm -hmm. ah, yeah. A man who says it cannot be done should mm. not interrupt the man doing it. You agree, Abi? Yeah? Completely. The man part or the proverb part? Uh, everybody inside. <laughs> okay. A man who you, says you, it cannot be done. You cannot do it. Just stay there and allow, allow the rest of us to continue. The one who is doing. Yes, please. Yes. Mm. We've heard you once. We don't. You don't have to keep reminding us it can't be done. Yeah. We've understood it. It can't be done by you. We've yeah. gotten that one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That we've, we've got now. Let us who don't share that thought process with you just yeah. continue. continue. Doing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Headlines. On the front page of the standard this morning, mm. Ryla faces tough queries from Azimio. Azimio principals carpet Ryla, rather Odinga, in a tense summit meeting mm. where the coalition leader was hard pressed to explain why he snubbed the party bosses on the African Union Commission job bid and how he reached a sort of a handshake with Ruto to a point of earning government support. Why? How? Who? Yeah. Tough question. Yanni Raila had not told his chaps. Apparently not. That you they know what, saw guys. it the way you saw it. <laughs> <laughs> why? Um, Partners. So can you understand why they're a bit salty? They're like, ah, where? What do you Niaje? mean? Mm. Mm? They've just like been trying to come out out here public and say, yeah, yeah Raila d d yeah, deserves like, it. Well, okay, but what are we saying? Raila is qualified. <laughs> <laughs> no, Azimio will be strong. After all, it's just a December bar. Two hours Come on, they didn't know. They had no idea. No. They were watching the press conference like the rest like of us. You. Like you. <laughs> Raila and uh, no, no, your no, uncle, no, Olushego. The they just hold the, the thought. Cow. With Olushego saying, just, I am... Hold the thought for a while. Right. We are talking about politicians reporting issues, aren't we? Mm. We are. You don't think that this is something that requires a pinch of salt? Maybe a lot more than a pinch, but hey. Yeah, but what are the chances that Raila had actually called this guy and told them, you know what, guys, By the I'm way, thinking. eh? Let's ask the question. Is he in the habit of doing so? No. So why are they okay, surprised? So then? <laughs> so they're asking a hard question. 
Or were they hoping that he'd set a new president? Uh, yes, uh. maybe. You know how they say you marry him and hope he'll change after. <laughs> yeah. EAC presidents to support one candidate for the AU job. I like the way that headline is crafted mm. to support one candidate. Mm. President Ruto challenges the East African Legislative Assembly, which we saw opening yesterday, to help change the narrative of Africa from a poor continent ridden with conflict and disease to that of immense opportunity, as he reveals that the region will back one candidate for the AU Commission chair. Mm -hmm. Nisawa? Mm -hmm. Okay. More protests over nepotism and tribalism. A day after a court dealt a blow to KRA over skewed job appointments, the head of civil service and contractors in the North Rift separately added their voices to disturbing trends of unfairness in the region. Mm. This thing is not going away anytime soon. A dread economy when sweet cane ruled in Western. CT, I'm sure, has a few stories about that as well. Uh, a few. <laughs> hmm. Business uncertainty to persist. Uh-uh. They should wait now. The U.S. Supreme Court, the apex court of the United States, has also done a thing. And they've said, what? Criminal culpability and Donald Trump, president? It can be in the same sentence. Mm. In other words, yes, he's cleared to run for president. So watch this. What? Space. Thank you very much. Crisis as top stars protest at new rules. We'll look at that. It's in the sports pages. But uh, that's what it looks like. More or what? Uh -huh, more or less. less. Let me tell you, I've got <laughs> the screenshots of uh, the other papers. Can I give you the headlines? Yes, just let me give you one more headline. Okay. Yesterday, yes. everybody went crazy yeah. because for one hour, yeah. uh, the platforms of Meta yeah. went off course. And people thought their lives had come to an end. Meta. Facebook. And Instagram. Instagram. <laughs> but WhatsApp was working. WhatsApp was working. Okay. So now They're all Meta. They're mm. all Meta. So now for an hour or so, the world... Now that the dependence on the social media is crazy. Mm. The world People happen? lost it. Ah. Everybody went to Twitter to, to talk find about out. to talk about what, how they are depressed because they can't access, <laughs> they can't Facebook, access Facebook and Instagram. Really? They were actually depressed. Mm. Ah. Ah, Coco. Okay. And the owner of Twitter X, Elon Musk, was like, "Oh, if you can read this message, it's because our we system got our is stuff up. together. <laughs> As guys, we don't have these small small issues." <laughs> That's our systems are robust. Mm. Yeah, Allah. That's why you've come here. Hatu Jakatiwa steamer. Yes. Melipas is to Melipas. Now, 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 sister, how is this in the way you're steamer? Hata, hata, magari is going to be steamer. Now, steamer. Yes. Ah, yeah. In the Daily Nation today, state travel ban that never was. The government's travel budget nearly doubled within three months of an October 2023 travel ban imposed to reduce wastage as globetrotting public officials ignored austerity measures amid tough economic times. This saw the state spend 7.05 billion shillings on local and foreign trips after the directive, a huge jump from the 4.33 billion shillings that had been spent earlier. Head of Public Service... <laughs> had written a circular to everybody saying, you know what, we are implementing austerity, so we are reducing travel. In fact, we're even reducing, limiting the size of delegations to travel. That's at time, time, time. Everybody said, twende. <laughs> twende. Well, they've said we go left. Let's go right. Twende. <laughs> so, the control of budget says, actually, in the period between July and December 2023, the government spent on uh, local and foreign travel expenditure 11.38 billion shillings. Okay? This <coughs> is compared to July to December 2022, where they had spent 8.1 billion shillings. Right? Similar period of previous, pre period of previous year, mm. 8 billion. Mm -hmm. This one, oh, austerity, austerity, 11B. <laughs> That's all. That's what I mean, why not? Yeah, it's in the measure, it's in the dollar. <laughs> Ah, yeah. The other headline in the nation, more pain as new ID and passport fees take effect. The government has implemented revised fees for some of its services, including passports, IDs, birth and death certificates, and work permits applications. This will see the fees charged on some services increase by up to 10 times or more. Mm. The new fees are being implemented following the conclusion of a public engagement exercise conducted between November 14th and December 5th last year. According to the government. Mm -hmm. So the government says, we came to you, the public, we asked you, and the public agreed that if you want to renew your passport, you want an ordinary 34 pages passport, 7,500 new, 
uh, old uh, it was previously 4500 you want a new id previously to register for an id fresh fresh you don't have an id it was zero shillings now 300 bob public agreed uh you want to get a duplicate or replacement of your id previously it was just a hundred bob but after going to the public and through public participation public agreed that we now charge a thousand shillings hey, here, which, which is public are you just asking the public <clears throat> if you're in the public that said no you're in the minority birth and death certificates you want to register for your death it was previously 50 bob usually people do it for you okay <laughs> You had to register for somebody else's death. <laughs> Previously, it was 20 bob, <laughs> 50 bob. Now it's 200. <laughs> uh, you want to register for birth. It was 50 bob. Now it's 200. Sawa. Other headline in the nation. Pay rise for 36,500 promoted teachers. Um, then drama as athletes are forced to compete. Threats were used to have athletes, especially those from the disciplined forces, compete after they boycotted the African Games trials at Nyayo Stadium in protest at the number of slots allocated for the Continental Games. So we have um, national trials for the upcoming Africa, all Africa Games in Ghana. Uh, our guys, athletes, were like, to uh, so Oh, just people who are there are from the police, from the prisons, from the military. They are told, ha <laughs> ha. They were all there. <laughs> so <laughs> fun. <laughs> so <laughs> fun. <laughs> they joined. <laughs> MPs increase own budget by 2 billion shillings. If you want it's to know a, a picture of austerity, yeah. Parliament has increased its budget by only 2 billion shillings after MPs reorganized the budget policy statement to raise its spending limit in the financial year starting July 1st. So, you know, like, 2 billion to... That's your pesa mingi. Sasa 2 billion to kitu kufanya mtu alia. Matakulia. Court told of how a woman plotted to kill her husband. Oh my goodness. Who be that? On the night of June 3rd, 2021, Dutch businessman Herman Rowenhorst went to bed as usual at his Rocco apartment home in Shanzu, Mombasa County, full of hope for a better tomorrow. Unbeknownst to him, the plan to eliminate him had already been finalized with his wife as the prime suspect. Oh. It's a story in the nation. <laughs> the Business Daily. Remember the company called RVR? Yes. to Valley Railways. Mm. Yes. They'd been given a 25-year concession to operate uh, trains on the old meter gauge rail. That thing was terminated in 2017. Now they have taken this matter to Court the course. International Arbitration Center in uh, London. Uh, okay? It. For arbitration. Because there is where they are revealing a London-based international arbitration has heard that Kenya and Uganda secretly planned to kill RVR and dispose of it as scrap to unlock billions from China for the construction of SGR. So they wanted to sell our VR scrap <laughs> to China so that China can, can, can do come and build. SGR. Hey, God. <laughs> hey. And, and, the the, and, 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 and the headline is <laughs> Kenya plan to sell old rail as scrap triggers a 286 billion shilling fight. You Someone actually make, wrote that article. You can't make this stuff up, man. Just oh, oh, yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, you plan can. was irreal. Kunja, 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 si kunja. Smelt it. Cut it up. 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 Cut where there was a heist that saw employees steal 94.9 million shillings while transporting cash to a bank in Nairobi. And this was from um, uh, a quick mat, right? Now, those were employees of Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo has offered to pay back the 80 million shillings to quick mat. Okay. Since when? Hmm? Since when? This when did it happen, sorry? Last year, November. Last year, okay, okay. Security firm Wells Fargo has admitted fault in a November 2023 heist that saw its employees steal the 94.9 million shillings while transporting the cash to a bank in Nairobi. And they're saying, 
mea capa, mea premium capa. It's sorry sana, polen shikeni pesa yenu. Shikeni sawa. Business activity post first growth since August 2023 on shilling recovery. That's the other headline, the ticker headline and that thing. People Daily says how NHIF was looted and Taifa Leo nikukamuliwa tu. That's the headline. <laughs> is to be milked too niku kamuliwa kamukam oh to be milked eh okay. serikali imeongeza ada za stakabadhi muhimu maradufu <laughs> au hadi zaidi ya mara kumi ya ada za hapo awali stakabadhi ni document document <laughs> document mm, remember the story we were talking about the documents id passport Ew, okay. certificate ni nini nini sat yeah sasa okay. according to ifaleo ora ora it's milking niku niku kamuliwa yes. tell us about traffic will do this is the situation room the only way to start your day Yo, Landy's road is a thing already and it's really early but hey so they're going towards Wakulima market in and outbound right around there there's a lot of traffic this morning stuff is being offloaded things are being carried fresh goods blah blah traffic that's what it means coming into the city also on the thicker super highway people coming into the city guys going to work doing business traffic all the way from garden city mall it's busy through to the pangani underpass and then guys on kiambu road said we cannot be left out let's also do what traffic coming in from westlands people have said not yet but around eight or so we'll do what traffic so for now things are moving okay in except those parts we've talked about let's see what happens as we get through the morning in the meantime won't you talk to us yes do it on spice fm ke on x hashtag the situation room mature intelligent talk every morning spice up yourself Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice FM. Mm. Please try not to laugh. Have you seen those things where they say, "Try not to laugh"? Uh. <coughs> Essentially, what they mean is prepare to laugh. Mm. Mashogu promises to restore full capitation. <laughs> <laughs> Wait now. <laughs> the minister has a sense of humor. <laughs> Please continue. After the principal, I shall not laugh. Out of. <laughs> Okay, sorry, please go on. <laughs> Mashogu promises to restore full capitation after mm. the principal's outcry. Note, had the principal's not cried out... <laughs> secondary school heads can breathe easy as students return from midterm break after the Ministry of Education said it would restore the 5,000 shillings slashed from every student's capitation funding. We're not talking about the fact that some 37% was still not paid last year, but okay. Cabinet Secretary Zika Machogu admits that the amount provided for the new for the free day secondary program at 22,244 had shrunk to 17,000. He said we had gone down to 17,000 and even that they did not pay because of the tight fiscal space we're operating in and the economic constraints, but I think now now the economy, I'm sorry, Aposasa. <laughs> is improving. Please read that again. But this is his direct quote, right? Quoting. Okay. I quote: mm -hmm. We have gone down to. We had gone down to seventeen thousand yearly because of the tight fiscal space we are operating in, and the economic constraints. But I think now the economy is improving, and we should get the figures which we would be, which would be given to each student at twenty two thousand two hundred and forty four. The economy of Kenya is improving. I'm telling you, my we brother. We shall get that five k back per student. When? Because the economy has improved. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he said that the admission, this admission vindicates secondary school principals who in November last year petitioned Parliament to intervene and help in collecting a debt of 54 billion shillings owed to the schools for a five-year period. The Kenya Secondary School Heads Association indicated the Ministry of Education was providing 17,458 capitation per student. Even with that reduction, my people, it is important for us to note mm. that the full amount for 2023 till today has not been completed Why? and even all this rubbish that you talk about oh don't pay school fees to the school directly schools are still asking parents 
for extra money. And why are they doing this? Because the money does not come from government. Mm. It doesn't come. We're not talking about maybe if tomorrow. No, mm. it does not come. Moving on. Okay. The, uh, according to her heads, in 2019 alone, the government did not send 3,167,804,931 shillings to the school capitation of this total capitation to secondary schools. In subsequent years, the funding deficit has only worsened with institutions not receiving 16, bi eh? 16 billion in 2020-2021, averaging about 5,000 deficit per child. In 2021-2022 financial year, the amount was 15 billion. That meant 4,451 did not go to school. So you wonder, then what were school heads meant to do? The biggest deficit was witnessed in the 2022-2023 financial year, the one I speak about, when the total amount owed clocked 18 billion, 101,294,218, equating to 4,905 shillings per child. This collectively, over five years, amounts to 54 billion. 220 million 185 thousand 855 mm. according to the petition by head teachers the funding problem is further worsened by the deductions done on the funds received by school this petition indicates the ministry retains an average of 1978 shillings per student for the school medical cover this effectively reduces the funding even further to an average of 15,479 shillings hey. and 36 cents. Basically, he's saying there's light at the end of the tunnel. There's no In tunnel. In fact, we are at the end of the tunnel. There's no tunnel, Eric. This one, you're underground. No, that, but the Machoko is saying we are at the end of the tunnel. In fact, now we can see light. The economy is improving. We are going to restore this 2,000 shillings. We'll bring it back. Don't worry, I teachers. Think, you I, relax. I think Machoko's advisors have woken up. Mm hmm Yes. How and, so? And his listening ear mm. has also sharpened. Mm -hmm. Because how do you quiet in such a storm? Mm. You know very well people are complaining. Children have gone back to school. Yeah. And that capitation plays a very important role yeah. in <coughs> their well-being in the school. Do yeah. you just keep quiet? Or do you come out and at least say something that has is injected with some form of hope? But, okay, surely. You know, there's hope that you can give in the light of things that you can see. <laughs> and then there's hope that you can give, like your eyes, ears, and all your offices are closed. Closed. Because the truth of the matter is right now, you say you're going to increase this 5,000 shillings. From where? One. When? Two. Number three, the money that you've owed them over five years is at 54 billion shillings. Mm. This means what? You didn't send the money that you were supposed to send to them in, con in, in its entirety. Number two, they had to get this money from somewhere else and they had to put a burden on themselves. Number three, parents are bearing the brunt of this by having to send extra money to school. Let's not get it twisted, you guys. This story that they talk about that schools are charging extra, yes, they are. Why are they charging extra? Because you have not fulfilled your responsibility when it comes to sending capital to schools this thing is not rocket science it's very simple mm. you didn't send the money they have to find a way to keep your kids in school so yes. who do they go to they go parents. to the parents parents don't want their children to be in school unfed unkempt uncared for or, or at home or when, at they should, home. when they should be in school exactly so what are they going to do we they need look you for to the pay money. another thirty thousand over the year what do they do they go and look for it i mean they shouldn't okay. come and vex me this early morning i beg you have one red it's very good now uh, brother cs is minister. Hey. Minister usually gets informe. Sean. Uh, even when there's backlash, he gets informe. Sean. So he has to make the statement. Meant. And he has to say, you know, guys, it isn't as though we're doing nothing. Mm. It's not like we're unaware. No, to no, 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 we this are amount. aware. In fact, what you don't know mm. is we are actually going to sort this thing out. Mm. <laughs> now, it is not the first time he has said such a thing. Mm. Exactly. <clears throat> it won't be the last time. Okay, mm. so for the moment, can we just go with the flow for at least an hour? Mm. Flow what? <laughs> oh, are you telling said. us, Abi? Yeah. Just, okay. No, no. Okay. He has said. Mm. Okay, okay. So an hour. <laughs> yeah, just an hour. Mm. Breathe in. You know, miracles do happen on planet Earth. Yes. There's a song in Nigeria. <laughs> Miracle, no the tire Jesus. Miracle. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, you didn't tire Jesus. So. 
as in Jesus was it as in I can keep doing miracles you over and tired. over. Hey, you didn't get tired. I'm trying to say mm. that I'm going to take the view that he has a plan. Oh or he has been told there's a plan yeah. and he has been told that somehow <coughs> there's enough money has been collected and some of it will be released to mm. schools. Mm. I'm going to take that view, okay? Until it is proved otherwise, it was like it has been proved otherwise before, this particular situation, I'm going to go with what the CS has said. Level two. Yes. For how long are you going with it so that we can also... Oh, yeah, just one hour. Until oh, okay. it Until 7, 7 <laughs> yeah. uh, But <laughs> I actually want to give a time and see. So today's Wednesday. <laughs> Let's see if by Friday something will have changed. Nothing will change. See Chimuga. Yes. Nothing will change, Bwana. What is this? Oh, ye of little faith. After you pass, I eat first term. Look, I beg. It's by Friday. You know, Friday is the day after tomorrow. City. Yes, I know. What see, you thinking today? Treasury money? has money. <laughs> <laughs> what? And the economy is improving. Yes. yes. <coughs> and the collections have gone up. Okay. Mm. Yes. Mm. And the care terrorists have been put on hold. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey. God. Look, a little hope is important. Okay. Final Minister final. has said, Yes. Mm. Let us give him time. Mm. And okay. let's see what they're going to do. If he can't give all, yes. she said five bob. Mm. If they find two bob and they give two bob, at least he has made progress. Now there's only three remaining. Yes. So let, let Let's give him time. Okay, no, Ahala. Step at a time. Oh. Segment, please. Okay. Fatherly. It's just like the State Department for Immigration Services <laughs> has been dealing with the matter of passports, you know? Yeah, yeah. Many, many people in the tens of thousands have applied for their passports. Mm. Now, the PS, uh, Mr. Julius Bitok, is saying, by the way, we have printed these passports and many of them are uncollected. In fact, 58,000 330 passports are yet to be collected from immigration offices. We are urging applicants who have already been notified that their passports are ready to collect them as soon as possible. He's saying, when a passport is ready, you're sent a message. Come and collect your passport. But 58,000 people have not gone for their passports. Why do I have to because be believing do. this? The PS noted that Nairobi has the highest number of uncollected passports, 24,613. Followed by Embu, 9,584. Kisumu, 6,087. Mombasa, 5,759. Eldred, 4,003. Many. Nakuru Kisi. All of them, over 3,000 passports in each station. The PS is adv advising applicants whose process has not yet started that they will be prioritized based on availability of the booklets paid for by the applicant. If you apply for a 32 page, you wait. We tell you to call a 32 page. Come out and go. Uh, also, applicants will be processed on a first-come, first-served basis, subject to availability of the specific booklets. This comes as the revised fees, charges and levies by the Department of Immigration and Citizen Services takes effect. So, the 50-page passport is now 9,500 from 6,000. A 66-page passport is now 12,500 from 7,500. To replace your passport... 20,000 shillings from 12,000 bob. But many people who have applied for passport, they are lying there uncollected. Okay, people should go and collect your passport, I beg. Let mm. them not give us any reason why they cannot continue because they will now say, storage, we can't move because, please, you people should go and collect your passport. If you but know you applied for passport and you paid, my problem is with it's these ready, numbers. go and collect it. Hmm? Then we can my problem move. is with these numbers. This is a very high number. Yeah. Yes. My problem, my problem is with this it's number. A very, very, hey, very people high don't number. apply for passports for the fun of it. Sure. Mm -mm. They don't go and look for no. at the time when it was four thousand five hundred shillings. People don't go and look for that money to go and apply for it to sit there. And they no. Don't go and no, it. they do not. One assumes that you had a plan. You either yes. wanted to travel or there was something in the future happening. Yes. You needed it. Yes. Or are we? And then you, how long ago? What's the length of time when this thing? I mean, this accumulation. now. Mm, what period is it taking? You are right, because also then lethargy will kick in, won't it? Yeah, yes, it will. And, that's number one. and then number two, what if someone applied and died? Abby, it's true. That's what I'm asking. How long have we had this backlog? Mm. Okay, Because it's being stated as though in, in the intervening period when we've had this problem, 58,000 people mm. have not. And I'm saying... Maybe this, some of these are historical. I yes, think so. and long historical. Mm. When did we start hearing about this passport, passport issue? It was mid towards... Mid. Eh, no, no, Even no, no. Matiangi's this, time. No, uh, no, no. The current one. This particular one where Kindiki went to sleep at Nyayo House those last days. year. Uh -huh. And, and year. what brought it about? 
uh, because people now were lining up. Yes. They they would go not yes. get go not get yes, right. Yes, exactly. It's, That's what. But before that happened, we did not hear this fifty eight thousand story. No, we did not. Exactly. It's a response to the complaints that had been there when people said, "Guys, why are we not getting passports?" Yeah. yeah. We and need to travel. Said, Where's the problem? Said, even, you even if you don't collect your passport, now, that is collect. it. Now, yeah. that is why I'm asking these numbers. Desegregated for us. Mm. Let us know. This year, how many people have not collected? The year before. Yeah. 20 years ago, 30 years ago. I mean, because if they haven't been collected, they haven't been collected. Of people yeah. who, who applied for their passports between January and March this year, yes. we have processed X number. Yes. S are uncollected. Yes. Break between it down for June us. and December last year, we, have, we had processed this. These are uncollected. So we can see that some of these ones are uh, current applications or previous applications. Better still, mm. publish the name so that we know. A passport is a public document. Yeah, just tell someone, come and collect. Yes, mm. exactly. Mm. These people have not collected their documents. If we publish names of students and what they have done in exams or those who have been admitted. Why can't we do that? Just say, look, these people have not come and collected their passports. If you know them, tell them to come and collect their passports. Yeah. Take a page in the newspaper. That document is not something that is prepared, then you come and pay for You pay for it, then it is prepared. Mm. So it means they paid for it. So mm. let them know and let them come and collect their passports. Mm. Yes. This story of passports and these numbers. This is a very high number. Yeah. 50,000 is number. a very, very yeah. high number. It's like they're trying to show that, you know what, we have sorted this matter. Mm. No, they haven't. And to justify and saying, you know, it's not as though we're not working. Mm. It's you people who also don't collect. This thing of throwing it back at us at we people. <laughs> <laughs> Don't like it, I think. No. <coughs> hmm? Story City? Well, uh, we am looking at East Africa. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. It's very interesting, though. Uh, let me look for a happy story. Happy stories are important. Yeah. Okay? Yes. There is a UN body, mm. okay, uh, called UNEA. Mm. United Nations Environment <laughs> Assembly. Mm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, they met... And they were determined to, and this is the meeting was in Nairobi, by the way, just in case you yeah, didn't just know. just ended last yes, week. Yes, yeah, 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 yes. They were trying to figure out, a, there's this thing called solar. Okay? Mm. Now, solar, we need to discuss it because solar has a direct relationship with what we call env environment. Mm -hmm. And the issue they were discussing was the engineering. And they were trying to adopt 15 resolutions. Mm. Okay? Mm. The understanding is so that you standardize this solar protection mm. and to understand what does solar actually do and the benefits, blah, 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 blah. Now, why this story is interesting is because they were supposed to arrive at an agreement, consensus, meaning people say, yes, we've agreed, let's move forward. You know, they can make this resolution has been passed and now this is the standard we're going to use. Mm. African nations said, no, them, they don't, they, they, they don't, don't agree. subscribe Sorry. to that kind of mm. thing. They, they, don't, they don't agree. This thing you're saying, mm. no, no. We don't agree with some of these things you're saying. We need time to understand. Mm. And then the discussion was, but you know, this engineering regarding solar is a bit complex. Everything that we don't understand is complex. That's why we don't understand it. Okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay? Yeah. So why don't you then break it down so that it's easier to understand? Because the sun we understand. Uh, solar heating we've seen, so it means it exists. Mm. But I think the issue here, it's often not that it's not understood, huh? It's what is not actually being talked about is the issue. Why are you insisting we pass this resolution? Because usually when these resolutions are being passed, you already have some organizations and companies that are just waiting for that resolution to, 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 to sail through so that they now drop those things in the end and go vap, meaning they were pre-prepared. I think the Africans woke up and said no. no. Mm. Yes, we, we, have, we have more sun than most of you people. Mm. So unless this thing can benefit us directly, mm. we are not bo <coughs> bo -ding. Yes. Guess I've who else is not boarding? Tell me. I tell you very fast. Mm. There's a president in a country mm. in West Africa. Yeah. The country is called Ghana. The president's name is Nana Akufo Addo. Mm -hmm. He has said he will not assent to an anti-gay bill until the Supreme Court rules on its constitutionality. Earlier, the finance ministry warned that billions of dollars in World Bank funding could be lost if it became law. Passed by MPs last week, <laughs> it imposes a jail term of up to three years for identifying as LGBTQ+, mm. and five years of pro for promoting their activities. Human rights groups went to court even before it was passed by Parliament. Gay sex is already against the law in Ghana. It carries a three-year prison sentence. The proposed tough new legislation, the Proper Human Sexual Rights Bill and Ghanaian Family... That's what it's called. Yeah, I've not proper. even finished. The Proper Human Sexual Rights and Ghanaian Family Values Bill. Very good. Was 
was backed by both of Ghana's main political parties, but cannot become law without the president's approval. Now mm. they're saying Ado is. So there's, but there's a there's a pending case in court. There is. And Ado is saying, Ado okay, is saying, there's no point of me. Supreme Court, tell us first, and then I can assent to this or mm. not. Okay? Mm. The bill has been widely condemned by the UK and the US, and rights groups have described it as regressive. Right. Ado has previously said that he would sign it if the majority of Ghanaians wanted him to do so. But he is now seeking to assure the diplomatic community that Ghana is committed to upholding human rights. He acknowledged that the bill has raised considerable anxieties in certain quarters of the diplomatic community and amongst them friends of Ghana but and that she may be turning back on her birthright. This man will not sign that bill. No he will pen not. is going on He paper. still has a begging bowl in hand like this. Uh, and the begging bowl here and then the and bill then is here like an bill. umbrella. <laughs> in fact, he may even sponsor another bill that says we are promoting all Human, human rights. rights. Mm. He may not mention LGBTQ, <laughs> but he'll talk about human rights uh, enhanced, in total. Enhanced promotion mm. of human rights in Ghana. Meanwhile, Bill. on Monday, <laughs> the country's finance ministry said Ghana would lose $3.8 billion in World Bank funding yeah. over the next five to six years. So if, what are you going to do? If you don't sign this, if you mm. sign this thing, not World so, Bank says we can't give you money. It's not so cut and dry, but innuendo is strong and smacking them in the face. Sheesh, man. <laughs> All right. Keep it here for more conversations coming up in the next hour. We'll be having a conversation about the uh, ride-hailing apps. There are very many of them in the country. International, local ones. This is a thriving business, but we've seen very many issues emerging from it. Let's address it. The boss of Bolt is joining us in the next hour. Good morning. 7 a.m. Spice up your life. Good morning, this is Newswire, Dennis Aseto. Interior Cabinet Secretary Kithure Kindik has asked security officers to cooperate with residents to deal with crime effectively. While speaking in Garissa County, Kindiki have expressed his satisfaction with the steps being taken by officers in dealing with crime in the north, promising to visit the area regularly to give them motivation that they need. I am proud of what our security forces are doing in this region to secure the country and make our region safe. I will be visiting them and, uh, so that we can engage with them and also so that I can be able to support them and give them morale even as they serve the country. I am asking the special forces who are working in this area to work closely with communities so that we move from the old way of doing things where the public does not see the direct connection and relationship with the security agencies. Kindiki has also said that officers dealing with terrorists and other criminal cases have successfully achieved their goals by using technology, modern equipment and advanced operations after being given special training. Serikali inaendelea kuboresha vifaa vya kazi vya maofisa wetu kwa sababu wakati huu tunatumia mbinu mpya vifaa vipya na tungetaka operation zetu za kiusalama ziwe na kiurafiki siwe za kiurafiki uma usiumizwe mwananchi asiumizwe tutafutane na adui tushughulikie adui Kindiki, while launching the office of the Deputy Commissioner of Shanta Abak Sub County, he promised that government officials will help the residents get ease. He also hinted that President William Ruto will officially open the office of the Immigration Department to help residents get passports faster. Nigerian CS Aisha Juma has noted that the government institutions are yet to achieve gender equality, even as President William Ruto is pushing for parity. However, the CS referred to the efforts her ministry has taken towards the implementation of two-thirds gender rule. 
mimi ningesisitiza sana katika masuala ya vyama wale wa viongozi wa vyama vya kisiasa waangalie sana masuala ya kina mama na pia waige mfano wa mheshimiwa rais kwa sababu yeye amejitoa na akasema kina mama wapewe nafasi ili wakaweze kujidhihirisha kwamba pia wana uwezo na kweli wanajidhihirisha ukiangalia yale matukio ambayo magavana wetu wanafanya wale kina mama hivi sasa kwa kweli ni ya kutia nguvu Farmers in Kamiga County are now asking Governor Fernandez Barraza to intervene and ensure that they get fertilizers and subsidized seeds after some of them did not get the fertilizer or input citing discrimination in the provision of inputs by the county government. Speaking at various agricultural officers led by Ruth Jonathan, they asked Governor Barraza to ensure that they get seeds since they've already prepared their funds for planting. Tunaomba governor wetu kwa isani yake atulete mbolea na mahindi tunataka kupanda kwa sababu tunataka ku kufukuza njaa. Kwa gava na tunaomba tu kwa vile tumesumbukana siku ya leo tumepotesa tuchapata chochote. Tulikuwa natarajia mbolea na mahindi atuchapata. Tumeshinda kutoka asubuhi saa 12. Sasa hivi tumeingia saa 11 atuchapata tunarudi nyumbani. Kama inawezekana tulete mahindi na mbolea kwa vile tushatayarisha mashamba yetu tunataka tupande tufukuse njaa. They said that there is discrimination in the whole exercise of providing fertilizers and other seeds serikali ilitutangazia kuna mahindi kuna mbolea sasa hizi tumepata mbolea peke yake mahindi hata tujui tutapata wapi hauwezi panda mbolea bila mahindi kitu cha maana ni mahindi hata kuliko mbolea na wanatupea mbolea bila mahindi hata tujui mbolea yenyewe tufanye aje nilifika hapa saa 12 lakini kulingana na system yenye iko tuliambiwa tungoje watu wenye warejeste mapema wapate na wenye tumerejeste wapi atungoje a report by the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission has laid bare how government officials siphoned money from the Edu Afia scheme. The anti-graft agency released the findings following an examination of systems, policies, procedures and practices of work at the National Hospital Insurance Fund. Minister of Education in partnership with NHIF rolled out a comprehensive medical insurance cover for learners enrolled in all public secondary schools in May 2018, which was dubbed Edu Afia. This scheme covered all children in public secondary schools in Kenya. This is news I'm Dennis Aceto. Good morning. Spice FM Nakuru all right, a few minutes after 7 o'clock and it looks like the streets are a lot busier than they were an hour ago. On the Thika Super Highway, quite some traffic coming in um, all the way from Kasarani today. So then, yeah, very busy getting into the city. Service lanes are looking good. You might want to think about using them. When you get to survey, you're going to have to snake it along into the city, but you should get there uh, quickly should you use the service lanes. Kiambu Road starting to pile up as well. Really early to have passed the DCI headquarters already. But hey, also then coming in on Limuru Road, um, you're getting towards um, Wangari Mavaiway and it's coming all the way in from Gigiri, but you're fine until you get to just around Parkland's Fifth Avenue and then you're fine. Okay, um, Ngong Road getting into the CBD is also starting to pile up and Uhuru Highway looks like it's going to be quite the beehive of activity today. If you're at Nyaya Stadium at the roundabout heading towards um, Lusaka Road, there's a bit of a hold up there. Jogo Road is busy. Coming off the Eastern Bypass is... Uh, not so bad for now, but that junction getting towards outer ring is. So stuff to watch out for here and there. That's what we do this morning. Let us know what's going on where you are and let's see how we can keep things moving. Talk to us on Spice FM KE on X hashtag The Situation Room. This is The Situation Room. The home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, newshound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. 
This is the city. Eight seven minutes after seven. The Good morning. Welcome to, to Wednesday. If you're just joining us, wherever on YouTube, on Facebook, on uh, KTN Home, on Spice FM, across the globe, this is Kenya's biggest conversation, the Situation Room, live every weekday morning, six a.m. to ten a.m. on this sixth day of March, twenty twenty-four. Do you have a plan? You know, it's it, it matters that you have a plan every day. Because if you just lose sight or track of your plan, then where we? Paragasha. You and your life. Planless. Quisha. <laughs> like that. And that's why I see a lion is saying, you know what? Eh? Come. What's your plan? If you have a plan, let's discuss a plan. Sindio City. Kabisa. And why? You know, mm. if you don't have a plan, mm. it becomes very, very difficult to do anything or in an orderly fashion. But the reason why a plan is necessary is because it's something that provides a direction you can rely on. It's a road map. Mm. Now, with a road map, you even know where the pit stops are. Mm -hmm. You even know where to pause. You even know what to do when. And if you need to change, you can change because there is something to change. Mm. But if there's no plan, what then are you changing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, if you suddenly encounter a roadblock in a place you hadn't anticipated, without a plan, mm. you'll be completely lost. But mm. with a plan, mm. you, let, you at least can even retrace your step backwards. Indeed. Indeed. And that's why I see Eliana saying, we've got experience, 60 years experience in this country. In fact, this year, they are marking their 60th anniversary. And they're saying, with all those years in place, we know a thing or two or three or 60 about you and plans. And that's why they say plan at icelion.co.ke is the email to send. Or you can go to their website. They have a special microsite that helps you understand what planning is all about. Plan.icelion.co.ke. It's important that you do that. City, mm -hmm. happy birthday, City Muga. May the Lord bless you and keep you well. Give him glory and thanks for the years that he has blessed with you with to many more. Here's a message to you. Well, I thank him. It isn't my birthday, but <laughs> <laughs> someone has posted that. This is, it's your birthday. No, no, me. I'm happy. I'm happy. You're me, collecting. No, me, it's good. You can. It's good. Oh. Where does it say I can only have one birthday? <laughs> this is good. Thank you, sir. Is it sir or madam? I don't know. Thank you. It's good. I'm happy. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm. And happy birthday to you as well. <laughs> now that we're, you know. <laughs> Happy birthday to you too. Yes. So I think the confusion came because yesterday was your brother's birthday. That was my brother's birthday. Yeah, so yes. we did a thing. Mm. So yes. that's where the confusion came from. Yes. It was Isaac Muga's birthday yesterday. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And yours is not today. No, but yours is coming. Definitely not today. But mm. yours is coming shortly. It usually is. Shortly. <laughs> it usually is. <laughs> In the month of March. In the month of April. 2024. <laughs> <laughs> Sometime this year. Yes. You'll have a birthday. I will have a birthday. A real yeah. birthday. Yes. Okay. <laughs> We're going to have a conversation about ride-hailing services in this country. And these are those apps that you use to call for a taxi or for Boda Boda and whatever happens. And there's, you know, all those things that people talk about. Eh, so now when uh, these guys came in, you know, we've been running taxi here. We, we, we are coming to eat our business. What happens to our business? And then they moved on into, okay, so now these people are colonizers and telling us to do this and the other. Let's have that conversation. Linda Ndungu is the country manager at Bolt Kenya. She's our guest for the next hour. Linda, good morning. Good morning. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> I love this greeting. This is what we should it do every day. It could be a day. new thing. Yes, you know? I love it. Why not? Yes. Mm. Mm. Chindio. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Welcome to Kenya's Biggest Conversation. Thank you for having me. That's the hot seat of the situation room. How does it feel? Awesome. It does, eh? Yes. Now, I know that you're running Bolt Kenya, but let's also tell you about whether you're running Bolt in other, country, other countries, yes. because there's a bank that can sort you out mm -hmm. in this country and elsewhere, and it's called Ecobank. Mm -hmm. You've heard of it? Yes. It's in 35 African countries. That's not all. It's in four countries outside Africa. Which ones are those? The UK, uh -huh. otherwise known as the United Kingdom. Uh -huh. The UAE, otherwise known, otherwise known as, as the United Dubai. Arab <laughs> Emirates. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Is it near Dubai? It's near Dubai. <laughs> <laughs> Next to Dubai. <laughs> <laughs> well done, City. Mm -hmm. China ah. and France. Wow. Parlez-vous français? Okay. Wow. So those four countries outside of Africa, 35 countries in Africa, wouldn't it be absolutely wonderful? You operate an account today and then you moved to Pretoria tomorrow. 
and you would be able to continue your banking transactions, wouldn't it? Say yes. Yes. Exactly. So now, that's what EcoBank has decided. Because you're plugged into this platform, you can move your whole life, mm -hmm. but you don't need to move your bank. And you can continue paying bills, and you can sort out your issues without having done anything just as long as you're plugged into the platform and they've seen you know what it can be done with your personal things it can be done with your business operations it can be done across board paying your bills it doesn't have to be a big move just because you did a big move mm -hmm. and because they realize that it's a better way and because it's a better way it's a better africa mm. that sounds fantastic safi karibu sana to welcome you to the show mm -hmm. ct muga whose birthday is sometime today in 2024. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you the day's proverb. And he goes to one African country every week, brings us proverbs from that country, and a proverb a day. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes. This week we're in which kingdom? The kingdom of Swatini. Mm -hmm. mm. Most people know it as Swaziland. It's no, no longer called Swaziland. Changed name. Mm. Mm? A man who says it cannot be done should not interrupt the man doing it. Mm -hmm. mm. Those of a you, man who says it, it cannot, cannot be, be done, done should not interrupt, interrupt the man who's doing it. We, we've it. got you. When you say it can't be done, we've understood you. And it's okay. It's all right. The, your position no, is no, clear. So you, well yeah, you go and stand there. You go and stand the corner over there mm. and face <laughs> east. <Okay? laughs> and let us continue doing Let's it. continue with those who those ones want to do. Mm. Mm -hmm. Linda, what's your interpretation of this proverb? I take it to mean that there are those who see the problems in a situation and there are those who see an opportunity in a situation. Mm -hmm. And so the ones who only see the problems, it's, it's good to call it out because then you, know, you point the others to the opportunity. So point it out, stand over there, pale kwa kona, then let the ones who see the opportunity just run with it mm -hmm. and make it happen. It's a good one. It's a very good one. It's a good one. Do you it's agree? an absolutely good one. Yes. Makes sense. <laughs> sure. Very good. Very good. Linda. Yes. Ride hailing. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a new phenomenon just a few short years ago. Yes. And now it's become like it's a normal thing. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's really, really grown in the country. Tell us from your experience in this. How's it doing? How's ride hailing doing? Mm hmm and what, are, what, what has made it become what it has become? That's a really good question. Um, so maybe just let me start with a bit of background before mm. I come to the question. I haven't always been in ride hailing. I was a career consultant, as we like to say, for about 10 years plus before mm. I moved into ride hailing. And so I got the privilege of experiencing it from outside, like everybody else. And before I was in it, I was you know, what is this thing? It's back in the day, it was the era of traditional taxis, yellow cabs from the airport. That's what we knew, moving from place A to place B with a traditional taxi partner, mm. paid for by your company. And so when this new thing came, I was like, okay, interesting. But to my mind, I thought it was a passing fad. Now, fast forward, I'm in the industry, I've been there two years plus, and it's really grown, I must say. It's grown in many ways in terms of the size of the business, in terms of the awareness of the business, in terms of the opportunities to spread in this country alone and even globally, mm. because people see the benefits of ride hailing compared to traditional private transportation, if I can call it that. What's the uptake been like? Quite good, actually. Yeah. And the thing that has helped it a lot, especially in this country, is because there's um, good smartphone penetration. And so typically most people have a phone that can download an app. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a phone that can download an app, you can take a, a cab online, you can offer services online. And so because of that, then we've been able to see across board multiple companies coming into that space, offering transportation services, which makes it cheaper. And when it's cheaper, then more people can ride. Mm -hmm. And that's what has led it to actually just grow over the years. So with the ride hailing apps, when they came into the country, yes. it was things of the phenomenal because you could then you know take a cab and the pricing was a significant drop from what folks were used to right so we're looking at less than half in terms of what you would pay over the same distance yes. how were 
these apps able to bring the prices so low for the same fuel you know you're going over the same distance but a significantly lower cost how how was this able to be done I'd call it an entry strategy because typically what most online apps will do when they're getting into a new market, new space, the app company will go in and have a lot of discounts. And so then if the price from here to town is 600 shillings, for example, the company will say, you know what, if you ride with us online, you'll only pay 150 and we'll give you uh, discount mm -hmm. for the rest mm -hmm. and then this discount gets reimbursed to the driver and so the first couple of years for most companies are n are not profitable mm -hmm. um, years because what you're trying to do is build up your ridership uh, get people used to this new way of moving and then now you can start scaling back on the discounts uh, to kind of bring it back to a level playing field mm -hmm. yes then that happens quite a bit because every so often there'll be a new company that comes into the market. And so that one, if they're coming in and the strategy is price, mm -hmm. you're always trying to compete on price. So it's a great risk, isn't it? It is. Because it you is. get me on board onto your platform. Yes. And then somebody else comes and they are offering cheaper rides. Yes. And all I need to do to get onto that one is just download the app. That is true. And... Over the years, because this has become a real concern now that there's more, more players in the space, more competition, then many companies are realizing there has to be something else. It just can't be price. And also, a lot of the customers that we serve are, I would call them designing customers, right? You want more than just, you know, cheap price. You want a price that fits your pocket, but you also want a nice trip. You want a trip that is safe. You want a trip in a comfortable car. You want to be sure... If you request for the trip, the trip will happen. So you want reliability. And so many platforms are building on these other value propositions, reliability, safety, in addition to affordability, and also having different categories. You will find that some partners have premium categories. And so you can get in some, in Kenya, we're not yet there, mm -hmm. but in some countries you will find your premiums, your Lamborghinis, your all those things as mm. part of a premium um, offering in, in a platform. So it's just differentiating to make sure that there's more than one value proposition for any client who wants to use the platform. What's on your mind, City? A you lot. Know, mm, mm. You know, the, you know, I'm thinking about what you're saying, mm -hmm. and I'm beginning to wonder then, what happens if you don't get the numbers? And at what point do you know mm -hmm you've reached that critical point where the numbers now make sense and you can now start turning the tide so that you actually now start charging what makes profitable sense. And that's a very good question. I would say that it varies from market to market. And typically before a player gets into, say you're coming into Kenya, mm. then we look at what we call the addressable population. We look, okay, maybe out of the... 10, 15, 20 million people who are over 18 and can actually move from place A to place B and pay money for it, we're going to get X percent if we do this for, you know, two years, three years, six months. And then on the flip side, there's probably, you know, 100,000, 50,000 potential drivers mm. that we can onboard. Mm. And so we... That, this is the bread and the butter. This is what we do every day. We, we kind of sit through and we look at, okay, how many drivers need to be with us? How many riders need to be with us to get to that point where you actually now not only break even, but it's a sustainable business? Because now um, free cash is no longer available, mm. if I can call it that. Uh, people are very excited about e-hailing when it started. And so there was a, lo a lot of money being put into ride-hailing companies because mm. it was new and everybody saw the potential. But since last year, um, there's been a bit of a cash crunch and now everybody's not just interested in how many numbers, how much, how many rides can you actually do? People want to know, bottom line, are you profitable? And if I can give an example of some of the big players when they started, they took almost nine years to break even. Mm. Now the companies that are starting now 
don't have that luxury mm. of years before you break even. So it's become a bit tighter. And usually this means maybe you need to start a bit smaller. Maybe you need to start with um, lower discounts. Like you just can't discount the entire trip, for example. If I go back to my example of 600 shillings, if previously someone could discount all the way to 150, now a new entrant might only be able to discount maybe half. Mm. Because over time, you want to make sure you're also profitable. It doesn't take you too long to get there. Mm. You know, for those of us who use taxis in an older time, mm -hmm. from the time when a taxi by definition had to be a genuinely dilapidated ancient vehicle. Yes. One which even be, way before you got in, you pushed it for it to start. Then you actually mm. got in yes. to that point where we now got the yellow lines and and, and what have you. Mm -hmm. Even when you say the price isn't discounted, strangely enough, it is still cheaper than the old, old, old taxes. That is true, uh, and I like to attribute it to law of numbers, if I can, if I can put it that way, because typically what happens in online or e-hailing. If um, I'm a driver, for example, I can see the value in doing 10 trips for a lower price because at the end of the day, what comes to my pocket might be more than doing one trip at a higher price. So if this one trip was 600 shillings and these 10 trips were 300 shillings each, at the end of the day, what I get in my pocket is more. And that's the whole premise of e-hailing from the driver perspective. So you do more rides and the price point is lower, but ultimately what you get in your pocket is more. But and then mm -hmm. the entry point mm -hmm. isn't that difficult for those who want to be in that business. No, that's a th actually, that's very true. The barriers of entry are here. Yes, exactly. Floor. But then that means that there'll be very many. So when there's that competition, apart from just the pricing, yes. the numbers of players mm -hmm. okay, who then join in. That competition alone, it means yes. that the numbers that you say, you see, the numbers of people who want to ride doesn't increase at the rate at which those who want to go be in the business does. That is true. So that profit that may have previously been there is now being shared by a much larger also true. pool of people. Yes. And so you'll find that most drivers have several apps. Yes. Mm. Okay. We call them multi-appers. Everybody yes. multi-apps. Yes. yes. Mm. So now... At some point, mm -hmm. I speak as somebody who utilizes those services regularly, daily. Yes. Okay, You will be told, and I always have a conversation with the individuals who are ferrying me from point A to B. Yes. They say, yes, you will make a living, but not as much as you used to before. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, when they speak, you get the impression they're making a lot more money then. Mm -hmm. because, and when you ask, they say, mm -hmm. after X number of years, I was able to pay for my car, I was able to even get a second one. They explain to you. Yeah, says, now yeah, I yes. can't. Right. Now, my question is this. Uh -huh. In any business, it gets to a point, there's a tipping point mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. When it gets to a point, if it isn't managed well, it stops making sense. It's true. What do you think will be the tipping point for this business? That's a good question. I... Perhaps would not call it a tipping point. I would call it a pivot or inflection point. Because what you're saying is true. The law of numbers only works to a certain extent. Mm. Before then, there's too many people. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, you know, we start losing the benefits. Mm. And it's called the law of diminishing returns. Yes, exactly. Mm. Perfect. So when that happens... Um, it's it's now, you know, like we were saying, is it a problem? Is it an opportunity? And so from the business side of things, some of the things that are coming to the fore is that perhaps then there's need to diversify. And this is why sometimes we tell our partners, you know what, okay, you started with traditional taxi services, mm. but you know what, now you can have, in addition to these ferrying passengers, you can transport goods, mm -hmm. you can be part of our food service so mm. we're creating multiple avenues where different partners who want to come in you don't necessarily just have to be ferrying passengers mm. and this is happening across board mm. with many of the bigger companies mm. because ultimately it's about creating gainful employment the partners that we have with us at the end of the day should see the value in being with us because ultimately if there's no value then you know the business will collapse yeah. so it's promoting e-commerce Yes, pretty much. Basically, just saying that um, 
from where you are, you can get a ride if you want to get into a vehicle to move somewhere, yes. or you can get goods brought to you if you have bought something and you want it to be delivered, whether yes. it's goods uh, or even meals. Yes. And that's become a big one. Yes. And now it's upon you to decide whether you want to use a vehicle or you want to use a picky picky or you want to use um, a, a bicycle mm. yes. to have it delivered. Exactly. And what works for you. Exactly. Now then, it means that you as the app, you have to have all these other You've got to have the, the, the vehicle, the picky picky, the lorry. Yeah? Yes. Okay. I want to come into the question of regulation. Yes. Previously, the old taxis, you were licensed by then TLB. Yes. Okay? Yes. And you had KRA, of course, with the licenses and the driver's license and all. Mm -hmm. Right now, the drivers still, because they own the vehicle, they have to go and get the NTSA stickers yes. for PSV. Yes. And they've got to take insurance yes. for their vehicles. Mm -hmm. Do you support them in any of those? Uh, so, indirectly, I would say, because we do enforce these requirements from a safety and a regulatory perspective it's uh we don't encourage our partners to come and join us if you don't have your license if your car doesn't have the licenses that it needs if it doesn't have the insurance and so what we've been doing and what other players do as well is then we help them to get their documentation in order sometimes this might look like organizing for a day when they can actually maybe go and meet partners at NTS NTSA or wherever they need to get their licensing to get this done. Or sometimes, depending on which vehicle it is, if it's a two-wheeler, if it's a four-wheeler, sometimes like two-wheelers, the finances are a challenge mm -hmm. to, to actually get the documentation that they need and so we can come to an arrangement with them and say that you know if you get your license after you do x number of rides then you get a portion of the money back just to help them get into that space and mm. get fully licensed yes mm. so who do you, who licenses you i mean what license does As bolt for example have yes. because when i get into that vehicle yes this guy bought the car He's fueling his car. Mm -hmm. He has the NTSA sticker. He has the driver has the driver's license. Yes. He's taken up insurance. Yes. And Bolt. Bolt is licensed by NTSA. As so what? so maybe let me just take a step back and say that coming to your point of we have different um, service lines, if I can call it that, right? We have the Bolt ride hailing. We have Bolt food, and we are about to launch parcel delivery. So these are different service lines, and it's not entirely clear from a government perspective if they should all be regulated by one partner, or uh, you know, one regulatory authority or multiple regulatory authorities. Because in practice, ferrying passengers is a bit different from ferrying food. Yes. So it might fall under a different agency in the government wings. Mm. Um, so while we're waiting for that, because the biggest business still remains transporting passengers, then we're licensed by NTSA. And as this what? is where we get our license come uh, from. As an online transport provider. I believe that's what they call us. Yes. So what does that come with? What's what's? It gives us license to onboard mm -hmm. our driver partners mm -hmm. and get into a contracting arrangement with them where then they offer services to passengers and we facilitate that transaction. That's okay. the extent of the license. Okay. Yes. So the, the regulation here is for me to be able to interact with your app. Yes. And for your app to be able then to uh, connect me with a, with a driver. Yes. I see. We'll talk about that shortly. Okay. Continue the conversation. It's half past seven. Our guest this morning is Linda Ndongo. She is the country manager for Bolt Kenya. We are talking about ride hailing services, this global local trends, what's happening in the market, just trying to understand this business and what happens. There are very many areas of concern, for example, on regulation, who regulates who, who's the boss of whom, um, and when it comes to now the using the service itself. Uh, safety concerns for both drivers and passengers and all and there are many we'll be asking those questions shortly keep it here we'll be back in a while this, this is the situation room the only way to start your day Welcome to the Delight Nakuru by Username Investments. Going only for 799,000 shillings for an eighth of an acre. There's borehole water, estate gate, graded access roads, electricity and other social amenities. SMS plot to 20321 or call 0725 000 000. 
Welcome to BBS Mall, the ultimate shopping destination in East and Central Africa. With over 1,500 retail outlets, thousands of parking slots, and more than 30 eateries, there's something for everyone. Enjoy our conference and expo facilities, kids' play area, and soon-to-come attractions like bowling and the gold souk. Plus, this Ramadan, we're proud to announce the opening of a majestic masjid accommodating over 2,000 worshippers, conveniently located, reachable within 20 minutes from anywhere in Nairobi. BBS Mall, unleash your shopping desires. I've got a plan to make my investment season hotter than a Sunday barbecue grill. ICEA Lion has a plan for everyone. Talk to us today for a plan that's right for you. Or visit icealion.co.ke. ICEA Lion, what's your plan? Partly sunny conditions in Nairobi, 17 degrees. We'll see highs of 24 and lows of 15. And lows of 15 in a partly sunny Nakuru at 16. It's 17 and cloudy in Yeri with lows of 14. And we'll see lows of 13 in a partly sunny Eldoret at 15. Mombasa sunny at 28 with lows of 27. And it's 29 and sunny in Malindi with lows of 27. Kisumu is sunny at 19 with lows of just that. And at 17, Kakamega will see lows of 16. Through Wednesday, it's cloudy in Kampala at 20 and sunny in Dar es Salaam at 28. Johannesburg is sunny at 20 with Mogadishu sunny at 29. And the sun is up in Addis Ababa at 14. Lagos is cloudy at 27 with Kinshasa cloudy at 25. What does it look like as we creep into traffic hour this morning? Um, still looking at heavy traffic coming off the thicker superhighway and likely to continue for some time as we get into it this morning. And on Kambu Road, yes, we're probably at Gate C now of um, Karura. And that traffic is coming in, heading towards Muthaiga Square and then, then into the city. Waiakure not doing too badly, but if you look at that crossover from James Gishuru, there's traffic there and it's spilling over all the way from... Um, um, Mzima Springs out through towards Waiakiwe likely will spill over towards the Red Hill Link Road so you want to watch out for that an alternate route might be to then come out through Chiromo and then onto Ring Road Westlands which is not doing too poorly then as you go through towards Chiromo and I on Langata Road some traffic then heading out it's starting to pile up and then spill over towards Raila Odinga Aerodrome Road is busy getting into the city via the uh, Nyaya Stadium Roundabout Junction so Looking out for that, we're getting into traffic hour. It's likely to get heavier, so wits about and buckles up. Let's talk in a short while. Spice of MKE on X hashtag, The Situation Room. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice FM, Nairobi. A talk conversation continues with Lyndon Dongo. She's the country manager at Vault Kenya. We're talking about ride hailing services in the country. Vault is one of them regulated by the NTSA right now, right? To offer this service of connecting me to a vehicle that will take me wherever I want to go. Other regulators, for example, in power, we have IPRA uh, that sets a base rate and says, this is how much you shall buy power from from the power producers and this is how much maybe you can you know regulate in terms of how you charge your customers are you given the same kind of regulations on how much you pay your drivers how much you charge your riders i like that question because it's been a hot question for mm. a while short answer is that yes the regulator has given some guidelines on what pricing should look like the long answer, however, is this pricing right now is not optimal for both our driver partners or the players in the industry. Mm. And how this came about is um, this space is new. 
even globally. And there's not, there's, there's fewer than 10 countries actually that have regulated this space in terms of giving guidelines as to how we should operate, as to what the price points should be. And so there wasn't much to draw on mm. when our regulator was trying to draft this kind of um, guidelines. And so what happened is, um, you know, we all came to the table, divergent views and the final, you know, resolution was finding something that meets everyone in the middle. But oftentimes what meets everyone in the middle is not necessarily the most optimal solution. Mm. And why I say this is that now what we have is a cap on how much commission a ride hailing partner can charge on every trip. And okay. while this is a good measure, sometimes it's not the best thing to limit how much a service or a good can be, right? Because different, if I just use like a normal service, if you're buying soap mm. at the shop, mm -hmm. you can buy a, a, a bar of soap for 50 shillings, you can buy a very high-end soap for thousands of shillings. Mm. It depends on a lot of factors, right? And so the regulator that regulates consumer goods, if they come in and they say, you know what, every bar of soap should be at 500 shillings. Mm. Then they have restricted the market. Those who have the purchasing power cannot actually buy the higher end goods. And then conversely, then maybe the companies that are making these high end soaps cannot be in operations anymore. And so while what we have is, is good for now, um, there is a need to revise it because while guardrails are important to ensure that, you know, it's a fair playing ground for everybody, it can also stifle business. Mm. And luckily for us as an industry, uh, the regulator, the Ministry of Transport are very open to these conversations and the driver partners as well because we've been living with this regulation for a year plus now and everyone has seen it's not optimal. Mm. Where nobody's making mm. sufficient money, so to speak. Mm. And so we're all back on the drawing board. We've been having conversations with the Ministry of Transport, with NTSA, with our driver partners and we're trying to see how can we reframe these regulations to make sure that they work for everybody. So that's a work in progress. But there is a baseline for now. Mm. Nobody can charge more than 18% commission on every trip. Who takes precedent in terms of importance? Is it the customer or is it the driver partner for the platform? Truly the driver partner. Mm -hmm. In fact, our internal mantra is focus on supply. And supply for us is a driver partner. Because mm. if we don't have the people who are offering the service, then even if we have so many people who need the service, there's nobody to provide it. And in fact, every time we have engagements with our drivers, we tell them, if it's not working for you, it's not working for us. It's not even a sentimental thing, it's a business thing. If we don't have our driver partners, we have no business. Even if we have the entire country wanting to ride. Mm. Yes. There's, a, there's always a concern when it comes to public transportation or whatever nature. There are certain categories of t public transportation whose notoriety is in the absolute negative. The cab, I would say cab hailing apps, <laughs> the cab hailing apps, <laughs> haven't gotten there yet, but the question of security has to be asked. When I'm on a trip, people who are in positions such as yourself have a clear idea where the cabs are, where it's going, who that person is, because all those details are there. What are the security features that you people have put in place to ensure that your clients are safe and that your drivers are safe? Because the drivers are also often in great danger mm. from the very passengers that they carry or people who purport to be passengers. That is so true. And unfortunately, across, across the globe, we've seen on the driver's side a lot of incidences, especially because we have female drivers also. So the safety question is to both passengers and drivers. And we have put in place several features, now speaking as Bolt, mm -hmm. um, some of the things that, that we've been happy to launch to aid in safety. For our drivers, we have a safety toolkit, we call it, within the app, where First, it creates the awareness of what are the kind of situations that you can find yourself in and you are unsafe, mm -hmm. right? So that then 
if you know, sometimes prevention is a first step to making sure it doesn't happen. And then secondly, we have a feature called an SOS button, which works for both riders and partners, uh, drivers. So this means that if I am in a situation and for whatever reason, I sense that I am not safe, it might not be going in the way that I thought it will be this mm -hmm. trip, I can press that button and in a couple of minutes, somebody will ring you and ask you, hey, are you okay? And we've advanced this feature now such that if the vehicle has been not moving for a while, uh, taking into consideration, you know, traffic and all these things, mm. but we've, we've set the configurations in such a way that, for example, if it's 2 a.m., there's no traffic. Mm. So if the vehicle has not been moving for that long, then there is a trigger and a message pops up mm. and asks both the driver and the passenger, are you okay? Mm. If they do not respond, then a call actually follows up because sometimes you're in a situation you cannot respond. Mm. So then there's a follow-up call and if then there's no response, then we dispatch some kind of emergency assistance. We call this trip anomaly and we keep rolling out these kind of features because we are well aware. Um, you know, as City has said, we're not there yet, mm. but we know that in public transport, um, when, when we're dealing with absolutely everybody, then these kind of issues can happen both ways. So we are always trying to proactively preempt what could happen and protect our drivers and our riders. Do you have data that perhaps informs you as to, well, well the frequency of incidences that drivers who use your particular app have faced areas where uh, some of these security issues are more likely to happen the day, the time, all these details? We do, we do. And what we do as part of also creating the awareness, we have within the app for our drivers a feature called unsafe areas because there are areas that we've noticed, these are the areas where there tends to be potential incidences mm. or more triggers. Mm. And so we give the drivers the liberty to select if they want to offer a ride going to these places or coming from these places. So uh, we, we actually map them and we say that, hey, this area is potentially unsafe. Mm. Do you still want to take the ride? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Now, with the advent of um, these apps, there was also then the suggestion that things would come into play like, you know, decorum, proper behavior, politeness, etc. So we reserve the right to demand such a thing, getting into the... Th Whatever happens in the past was history. Whether mm. somebody wants to be rude to you, if you hailed it on the side of the road, fine. But now with the app, it's expected that you're going to be treated in a certain way. That certain things you don't expect from a driver, you know. Um, mm. You don't expect them to speak in a certain way or behave in a certain way by virtue of the fact that they're on this platform. Mm. However, they still happen. Yes. So what is expected of the drivers because by virtue of the fact that they're on this platform and what recourse is taken if those things don't happen because it is a huge huge complaint that drivers treat their route their, no it's uh, that drivers treat uh, passengers poorly mm. that's true um and what we try to do is we try to manage it from before it happens mm. and then if it happens so before it happens before we onboard our drivers, we train them on various things, including and especially customer support. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if we have driver partners and I come in and I take a ride and it's a terrible experience, one, I will never come back. And then two, I'll tell all my friends and my family. Mm -hmm. So nobody will ever use that service again. And it will not be the driver, it will be the app. Exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, so we all lose. And, and we try and sensitize them because we've realized that sometimes um, driver partners don't necessarily realize that this is a ripple effect of being rude to one person. We all lose. We lose our clients. We're not able to make money. Everybody is frustrated. Everybody loses in the end. And so we bring them in and, and we, you know, train them on why is this important? Because sometimes a why is, is what they're missing. Mm. Because, you know, someone will come and tell you, but I'm, ha I'm having a rough day. This person should understand. Mm. No, your customer should never understand that you're having a rough day. Mm. You know, like in most service industries, they say the customer is always right. Even when they're wrong, they're right. Mm. So we try and instill these kind of values in them for them to understand it's their business. They are entrepreneurs. If they lose that customer, then, you know, it's a loss maybe for life even. Mm. 
And then, even when it happens, because, you know, people are people, so sometimes it does happen anyway, then there's a host of measures that we have in place to manage this. And depending on the degree of the infraction, if I can call it that, if someone was, you know, said something that's not pleasant, maybe that's a person who can be retrained and kind of reminded that this is not how you operate on the platform. If it was something more serious, then more stringent measures might need to be taken, like you, you're off the platform for some time to just kind of help you realize that this is not the way we behave here. So there's a whole host of um, things that we can do to actually the, manage the behavior. Is there, is there a way for a rider to actually post a specific complaint yes and yes. say i was in this particular uh, car and this is what the driver did i've had cases where maybe the, you you were going somewhere and you decided let me no this is not where i wanted to go let me change mm -hmm. the destination mm -hmm. and the driver just flips and says as well how to get the block the car you can't get out you can't pay you can't if you were to experience that, mm -hmm. how do you report that immediately? So and how, mm -hmm. how do you deal with that driver? Yes. So for those kind of extreme cases, you know, where someone is being rude, they block the car, those kind of things, I would suggest heavily that this is now a safety incident. It's, it's press the SOS button. Have someone remove you from that situation because that is a potentially flammable and dangerous situation. When it's a... Uh, no more, you know, the driver was rude to me, but we finished the trip and all is otherwise well, then we do have in app. You can report, you can raise a ticket in the app and you can go in and you can say, you know what, this particular trip didn't go well and there's a you can select the reason why. And then you can also write to us. We have an email address and we have a, a full customer support team on the back end mm. that responds to all these tickets and emails that come in. Mm. Yes. And how well do you know your drivers? What information must the driver give you before you get them on board? Right. So we know them, I like to say, to the extent that the government knows them. We mm. ask them for their ID. Mm. We ask them for their license. If you're a four-wheeler, a car driver, we ask you for your PSV license as well because we not only want you to have your driving license, we also want to be sure that the government has said you're fit for public transport. Mm. So your driving license and your PSV license. Mm -hmm. And then we also go the extra mile just because of, you know, rising safety incidences. We ask them for a police clearance certificate. Mm -hmm. Then we can be sure that this particular person who's joining us does not have a prior criminal record. So these are the four things that are essential for us. Do you have a photo of the part? Of the oh, yes, and a photo. Yes, yes. So five things. Mm. Yes. This police clearance certificate, what exactly is it supposed to do? It helps us to understand if this person has had a criminal record in it the does. past. Yes. How? Because it has a record. If, if you've been to jail uh, in your police clearance certificate, I think it's page two, they write that, or if you were taken to court for whatever reason, then it's there on the second page. And what are the, this, this thing they call certificate of good conduct? Yes, the it's one. the same. It's that one. It, it, it was just renamed, yes, to a clearance certificate. Mm. Yes. Okay. It's the one. It's the one. So, you have called a boat mm -hmm. and the guy comes, different vehicle, or the guy who is using the car, you know, and the guy is using the car, and the person who's come is different. How do I know all these things? So I'm now talking about now safety for the yes, passenger. The passenger. Uh, we've done over the recent past a couple of things. When, a, when you order a trip, you can see, if I'm the driver, you can see my face. You can see my name. Mm -hmm. You can see the car I'm coming with. You can see the color of the car I'm coming with. You can see the number plate of the car I'm coming with. Mm -hmm. And so what we recommend to people is, as a vehicle is approaching, already you can see the, the color. You can, when it comes close enough, you can see the number plate. Mm. Before you get in, call the driver by name. That's, that's the most efficient way to actually know if this is the right person. And if it's the wrong person, just cancel. Cancel. When you cancel a trip, the first thing it asks you is what went wrong. And then you will have those options. And you can say the driver was not the same mm. as the app. So you should actually then refuse to take the trip. Is yes. that what you're saying? Yes. Do you know what they've said? Uh -huh. 
on several occasions they say mm. oh it's a it's a different vehicle than that which has come obviously so it's a different number plate mm. and they say well you know i was upgrading my vehicle mm. and Bolt is now the one. To a bolt or uh, yeah, they've not put in the system, so I cannot <laughs> stop my business. I must carry on. I I agree, but I would also suggest that sometimes this is not true, mm. because um, it could be that case of uh, I'm just I. I want to make some money. I don't have a car. I've taken somebody else's car. And it could be legitimate, right? And the trip will happen and you'll be fine. But it could also be, I'm a thug and I stole somebody's car. For this purpose. Yes, yes. for this particular purpose. And that's why to be, you know, better safe than sorry. Because it is true. And we get a lot of feedback that, you know, I used the wrong car and it was fine. It happens. But we always have, every so often, I took a wrong car. And actually, it was someone with ill intent. And it did not end well. Mm. Because they, they don't have much to lose. The car is not theirs. They're not the one on the profile. So what they do is they create problems for the person who is attached to that driver profile and to that car. If there's a criminal case, because sometimes it does happen, it becomes now a proper court case if mm. something happened. It's very difficult to find the actual person. If I stole your car mm. and I was using your credentials, you're the one that the police will come after. Mm. So it's it's so, just to be safe. So it's better to not case, take it. Okay. Yeah. So in this case, where is recourse? Because I would not have come into contact with this individual yeah. if something happened. Mm. I would not have come into contact with this individual had it not been that I was on the platform. That is true. Isn't it? Yes. And if something then went all right, mm. then, and we had to deal with it, mm -hmm. who takes responsibility this person who we don't even know who they are because mm -hmm. clearly the name on the thing is different from their real the name, and, the name. Yeah. <laughs> and different from the, the 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 number plate so who am i even taking anywhere yeah but the one that i do know is the platform i say excuse me you send me a vehicle mm -hmm. you know and a person who did one two three who takes responsibility so typically that's what happens because mm -hmm. your link is with the platform right and so you as a rider will bring the complaint to us mm. and then we now deal with it with the police. Mm. Generally, we escalate these cases to the police, especially if it was a serious like assault case or something of this nature or your wallet got stolen and we don't know who this person is. And so the police come in and then we follow due legal process. Mm -hmm. And typically what happens is the owner of that profile needs to tell us who this person is mm -hmm. because unless it was a straight out someone, right. you know, yeah. uh, held a gun to your head and mm -hmm. took your car, Please tell us who this other person was. Mm -hmm. So in the back end, this is what happens. And another thing that we want to bring in is because, you know, sometimes it happens. You're in a hurry. A car comes and you want to go and all these kind of things. We, we want to also address, you know, what's the issue? What's the root cause? Why is this happening? And we find that a lot of drivers who do this is they, they do want to offer the service genuinely, but maybe they don't have a car. Mm. And so the only time they can get this car is when their uncle is not using it, when they're on lunch break. Mm. And so we are trying to kind of address this kind of underlying issues. Um, and one of the things we're bringing into place is vehicle financing, because then if you want to offer services and you can't actually truly afford a car, Maybe you can find a down payment and then we help you to finish uh, your, uh, your payment over the time that you need to. And we can kind of manage the, how much it will cost you because we can tell the people who are bringing the vehicles, you know what, this person will be offering rides on our platform. So you, do, you know they're not a flight risk. Mm. You know they're going to be paying you on time, which then means in the end it will be cheaper. So we're trying to also understand because sometimes these things are symptoms mm. of yeah. the underlying problem. Yeah. So we deal with the problem, but then we also try and understand, okay, how can we make sure it doesn't happen again? Mm. Yeah. You know, any business that wishes to ride the tides of time mm. uh, profitably, we are told, have a research and development department. Uh, you know I'm going with this, don't you? Yes. So why don't you hear some? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a great question. And I, I completely agree. We, we must always be forward looking and see what next and how can we keep this business vibrant and growing and beneficial for all parties. And so I mentioned one thing, the diversification into different services. That has come from our research and actually just trying to understand what is it that can help both our, our driver partners and ourselves and the economies in which we, we operate. And uh, the other thing that we look at very keenly is sustainability. Because, you know, transport is a very interesting space when you look at it in terms of the environment. Mm. Uh, we contribute a lot 
to the negative effects to the environment, if I can say that. Yeah. Although I would say that maybe we contribute less than private cars, but you know what, we're still there. We're still mm. in that mix. And so we're trying to see how can we be more sustainable? How can we make sure that this business is not killing the earth, even as we continue to grow? And we're moving into spaces like electric bikes, electric cars. Mm. This is a future we're looking towards. And this is what our research and development teams are actually actively working on. Mm. How can we get into this space faster? How can we make it the norm Mm. that we're all going electric and we're moving away from all these traditional vehicle options that Mm. are not the best for the environment? Mm. Yes. CRB, Credit Reference Bureau. Mm -hmm has its negative side but also has its positive side in that because you're sharing information about the people who are taking credit now financial institutions get to know a customer do you think you need to have something like this as ride hailing platforms where you can share information about maybe drivers who are perennial bad mannered drivers Mm -hmm. or clients who are perennial bad mannered clients so that you all know okay so and so comes and applies to be a driver on your platform, please know that this person has been flagged by the other uh, company. That's a really good point. Uh, Fun fact, this is supposed to be happening right now. It's part of the regulations that we are all regulated under within the NTSA guidelines. The truth is, It has been difficult to implement because the way it was supposed to work is the government was to offer that mechanism so that all of us can plug in. And I can say that, hey, you know what, Amos is a not great driver on our platform because of one, two, three. And so maybe on our platform, we have blacklisted him. Mm -hmm. And so everybody knows. And this was actually from the government and we thought that was a really good initiative, but we've not been able to implement it yet. Um, Hopefully this is something that will come even as we continue these deliberations, because it is true. Sometimes a few bad bad apples apples Mm -hmm. ruin it for Mm -hmm. for everybody else. And Mm -hmm. so if we can call them out and have them out of the industry, then it will be better for everybody. Linda, thank you very much for joining us today. You're most welcome. Thank you for having me. I was happy to be here. You've shed a lot of light. Somebody's saying you should be hired as a government spokesperson. (laughs) 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 You speak very well. Linda Ndongo is the country manager for Bold Kenya. She's been our guest. We've been getting to understand this ride-hailing services business, and we've learned quite a bit on what happens in this industry. Keep it here for more conversations. 8 a.m. Good morning. Spice up your life. Good morning. This is Newswire. I'm Dennis Aceto. Health Cabinet Secretary Susan Nakamich has appealed to doctors to abandon their plans for a strike and give dialogue a chance to resolve challenges facing the health sector. Nakamichi acknowledged delays in the hiring of over 1,200 medical interns, said the ministry is working on modalities to ensure the issue is addressed and pleaded for patience, as some of the issues can only be addressed through stakeholder engagement with other government agencies. Doctors issued a seven-day strike notice to protest delays in hiring of medical interns and poor working conditions. Nakamichi presided over the flagging off of cold chain equipment for vaccine storage to the account is donated by UNICEF and Gavi, urged doctors to withdraw the strike notice and come to the negotiating table. The Kenya National Human Rights Commission now wants the National Assembly to hold the British Army operating in the country to account for several cases of human abuse. In a report presented to the Defence Foreign Relations Committee, the committee listed several incidences of murder, rape and exploitation that have been allegedly committed by the British Army Training Unit in Kenya, commonly known as Batuk. In a report submitted by KNCHR Chairperson Professor Marion Mutungi, 43 complaints received by the Commission against Batuk date back as far as 1975. In the report, KNCHR points to the mistrust by the host community in the British Army following several incidences of lack of justice where the Army has been accused of committing different crimes including murder, rape, maiming and assault. 
Now, East CDE teachers in Home Bay County have planned to take to the streets against what they say is the county government's failure to give them a permanent contract. The teachers say they signed a permanent contract with the previous government of former Governor Cyprian Awiti, but the contracts were cancelled by the current government. Through their union, the teachers said they will strike and organize a protest in Homer Bay Town. The union's chair, Michael Odera, has said that the situation is affecting them. We were here today as officials of Homer Bay High Teachers. We, were, we came to inform the police of uh, our planned peaceful demonstration come Wednesday. Homer Bay County teachers are seriously suffering. We were promised confirmation by this current government that we were to be confirmed in process as from this year 2014. We had been given a secular on the same but uh, the, current governor, gov the current government has failed to honor the pledges or the promises that he made to teachers concern con concerning the same. Up to now we have been given two circulars from the county secretary informing teachers of confirmation come January. They have not honored up to now, we are still waiting, teachers are getting negative salaries, teachers are suffering, teachers cannot teach well, teachers are demoralized. Our Ochanda and ECDE teachers said that the situation has been life difficult. And police in Kajada are holding three people in custody over suspected drug trafficking. The three, George Laban Ogutu Ogangira, Yahya Abdullahi Songolo, and Sharon Wanjiramburu, were nabbed in a sting operation last week while in possession of four bales of bangs stashed into sacks. According to a statement by the Directorate of Criminal Investigations, the trio was intercepted along Ongata Rongai Road near Multimedia University with some of the bales of the narcotic drug. DCI says that a further probe into the matter would later find two other bales at one of the suspect towns in Joska, Machakos County. And police in Hotel Gun are detaining a GSU officer for allegedly defiling a 17 year old girl at a home village of Chepkurkur in Kopsiro area. The minor, a Form 2 student at Chepkurkur Secondary School, was reported caught pants down with the officer inside a brothel. According to police reports, the girl's uncle got wind of news that a niece was in a nearby brothel with the officer after the girl was sent home to collect school fees. Following the incident, angry residents stormed the brothel and frog marched the pair to Kipsigon Police Station. This is Newswire. I'm Dennis Aceto. Good morning. One hundred two point five Spice FM, Kisumu. Okay, um, after eight o'clock, and traffic is heavy coming off of Langata Road. Some of that will split towards Rilo Dingaway, and then the rest of it's going out through towards the Nyaya Stadium roundabout, and then Aerodrome Road on Jogo Road. It's busy. Landy is doing the same thing, and onto Haile Selassie, which is busy. Then getting into the CBD, and then joining with what's coming off of Ngong Road later. All right, coming in from the Outer Ring Junction on the Thika Super Highway, traffic is heavy through towards Muranga Road on one side and Wangari Mathai on the other. And that's all joining with traffic that's coming off of Limuru Road. So yes, it is a busy morning. What's coming off of um, Waiaki Way? There's traffic there and James Gisha Road traffic spilling over towards Red Hill Link Road. Very slow, trying to then connect with Kuna Road. So all of this is happening at the same time. There's traffic coming off of Lower Kabete, heading out towards the junction with Kuna Road as well. We are in traffic hour. Let's see what happens as we go through the morning. And we'll talk on Spice FM KE on X. Hashtag the Situation Room. This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, 
controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is Echo the bank situation. Is a pan-African bank. Echo Bank is saying Africa is coming together to trade as Africa, to trade as one big trading block. The Africa free, con the Africa continental free trade area. Looking at all those other regional blocks, the economic blocks where there is a lot of trade, and the conversation is everybody is coming to Africa. In a very few short years, Africa will have the population that everybody is looking to tap into. Mm -hmm. So business will be where here. Yeah. And that's why Ecobank has said, you know what, we are running ahead. Mm. We want to make sure that we facilitate the financial services system so that it works seamlessly across the continent with one platform. Mm. And that is everybody plugs in essentially to the same platform. And it really doesn't matter where you do business across these 35 different markets in Africa, that you can make sure that your business doesn't stop just because you move from place to place. <coughs> and I mean, it's fantastic. The world is coming and going. And how about one thing that remains steady? And that's this platform where your business transactions don't go to bed just because you do. Don't take a holiday just because you do. And says because you're into this platform, business can continue seamlessly. Your bill payments can continue as though you never left. So with 35 markets in Africa, and that doesn't even talk about the branches, and over 14,000 employees, four markets outside of Africa, definitely ready to do business. It's a better way. It's a better Africa. Mm. You know, planning is a very big thing, and that's why the plan is a big thing. Uh, when Kenya Kwanzaa launched their manifesto, they called it the plan. Okay, and they broke it down in this is the plan. They didn't talk to ICLI, and they should have. But you, when you're thinking about coming up with your plan, talk to ICLI. It's important to think about what you want to do. Like the other day, it was just revealed to us. We actually did not know. But now we know that in five years' time, City plans to go back to the Maldives. Do you want to go and work there this time or is it just another holiday, like the last time? <laughs> uh, are you going alone this time or are you going with more people? <laughs> <coughs> What's the plan? My plan, mm. when we travel, you go with more people. <laughs> no one is going to allow you to go alone. Mm. <laughs> you cannot find yourself. There are many directors in that company. Bus. And there's even a chairman. Mm. I am just a humble worker. Mm. Yes. <laughs> so. <laughs> and the plan is? to start working towards getting there. Yes. And now, the good happened. thing that you need to do mm. now in that company of yours eh, is bring everybody on board. Yes. Tell everybody, okay, so the plan, the general plan is Maldives five years. Mm. Now you come up with your individual plan. Mm. How do you get yourself there? <laughs> 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 and then send them to ICLI on <coughs> all of them. What? Mm. That is a very good plan. Sindio. It is. It's a very good Everybody, you want to go to come to the Maldives with me? Mm. <laughs> Have your plan. Have your plan. <laughs> so that we can. So go. that we can go to Maldives. Everybody write a, an email, plan at icelion.co.ke or go to the website plan.icelion.co.ke. Next, next hour, we're going to have a conversation about plan, plan for the future. What's the plan for those who are in grade 7 today? Or those who are in grade 8 today, the plan is to go to grade 9 next, next year. year. After grade 9, the plan is to go to? Grade 10. And the grade 10 is no longer a junior secondary. No, it's senior. It is now senior. Secondary. What are all these things that we're talking about? Mm -hmm. It's because we're running out the curriculum, competency-based curriculum. The person <coughs> who's in charge of rolling out this curriculum and seeing the curriculum development in the country is Professor Charles Ongondo. He is the CEO of the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development, KICD. Prof, good morning. Good morning. Welcome and, uh, to the hot seat of the situation. Me the situation room. Karibu sana. Asante. To welcome you to the conversation, the man who's planning to head to the Maldives in five years' time <laughs> had made a plan previously and he succeeded. He went to a country in uh, the southern parts of this continent and he has brought up proverbs. So you listen to his proverb. He'll tell us which country. It Listen the, to the proverb, yes. and then you'll give us your interpretation of it, Prof. It's the kingdom mm. of Swatini. Mm -hmm. 
Well, previously people knew it as Swaziland. Mm. That changed. Okay. Now, the proverb. A man who says it cannot be done should not interrupt the man doing it. A man who says that it cannot be done should not interrupt the man who's doing it. Mm. Professor Amond, I'm sure this one applies very well to you. Clearly. <laughs> What's the yeah. interpretation of it? <laughs> yes, because we want to be where the rest of the giants of the world are. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only thing that can get us there is a relevant curriculum. Mm -hmm. And uh, definitely we shall have challenges uh, getting to be alongside the best. But it has to be done. And uh, those of us who are doing it should not be told not to do it. So very <laughs> applicable. That's the thing about proverbs. Uh, they never die. They never die. No. They remain strong. And as long as it's African, it can be applicable in any other African context. Okay. Yeah. Karibu sana, Prof. Already people are saying they are students and they are saying hello to you. I'm sure you've met with one oh, of yes, the students yes, walking yes, out. Yes. I'm strong. He's already saying, I spent, uh, you taught me at Moy. <laughs> <laughs> I spent 16 years uh, teaching at Moy University. And... Uh, among the departments where I taught was the Department of Communication Studies, where we were uh, facilitating people who had interests in being journalists. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure a number of them are here. And one of the things that will always make you happy is to meet someone, they shake your hands and they say, you are my teacher. Mm. Mm. Gives a great pride. Oh, yes, it does. Yeah. Mm. It does. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it certainly does. In fact, makes your day. <clears throat> it actually beats anything else that you may have done. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Just someone yes. tell, and they'll tell you things that you've probably forgotten about. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yes. Uh, they'll tell you the jokes you made. Mm. They tell you the few times they thought you were very hard on them. Mm. <laughs> the, t the moments you had carried them when they were very low. Right. Uh, but the f just the feeling that they made it and that you made a contribution to it mm. is very energizing. Okay. I can tell you. Let's talk about CBC, yes. Competence Based Curriculum. We've had conversations here a number of times before. When we've asked ourselves, all right, so we are changing the curriculum. We are changing the curriculum. Are we improving on the current, on the previous curriculum, or are we overhauling the curriculum? Or what are we doing to the curriculum? In fact, CT's always the question he asks is, what was wrong with the other one exactly? And why are we changing it? I'm sure you are involved in the conversation that brought us to the CBC. Yes. What is the thinking? Uh, very, very good questions. And I'm very grateful that you brought me here to be able to talk about some of those issues because uh, we are not changing the curriculum because there was anything wrong with the previous one. Uh, it's not even correct to say you're overhauling the curriculum. We are reviewing and review is a constant part of human life to be consistent with the changing times. I'm sure that even here, and if we say in the spectrum of journalism generally, a lot of things have changed in response to a lot of things that are also changing around us. So basically we are reviewing the curriculum. What we had served us, still serves us, but there are moments then you take a step back and you look at what you are offering and you say, how can we improve? So of all the terminologies that you used, uh, Latte, I will mm. take improvement is the word. Mm. Yes. Improve the curriculum. Yeah. Well, uh, Prof, you are among the very few people who actually use the term. You see, the question arises from statements that are probably made not by professionals like you, but purveyors of politics who have entered the education space. Mm -hmm. And they talk of it as being new. And you're asking, mm. what exactly is new? Mm -hmm. That's where the question arises from. Yeah. And then they seek to employ you to understand yeah. that apart from it being new, <coughs> it's going to bring about all these changes. And you're asking the question, the previous one that you say we had, did it not also promise the same mm -hmm. and also, also bring forth the same? So then you ask the all eternal question. Yeah. So what really is new? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. CT. Uh, and, and that puts us in the right trajectory, in my view, because let's start from the question. Mm. What is our curriculum? Before we can even talk about what's new about it. Mm. Basically, we are talking about all those learning experiences that learners in the space of the school system will be exposed to, to enable them acquire basically four things. The knowledge that is required of them, the skills, the 
attitudes and the values. Now, this is what we package in one word called competencies. Mm -hmm. uh, and those experiences that learners are exposed to in the school system can be looked at in three ways. Mm -hmm. There is the formal, which is what most of us talk about. In fact, when we talk about CBC, a lot of us are just focusing on what is on pen and what is on paper to be covered on a Monday or a Tuesday in the term in the year. But there is also the non-formal. Mm. And then there is the informal. Mm. Now, all these experiences are geared towards, now we have agreed we shall use the word competencies. Mm -hmm. What competencies do we want to give our learners? But a bigger question is what do you want the country to do with the competencies? What competence does the country need? So just to get back to City's question on what is new, um, what is new largely mm. will be that we realize there are certain aspects of knowledge, there are certain skills, there are certain competencies that this country requires that currently we are not offering our learners in the manner that they require. That's one. Mm. Two, you think about the way in which we offer that, the experiences I talked about. Uh, in, in, in academic terms, we call it pedagogy, but we basically talk about learning and teaching experiences, learning and teaching methods. You might even add there uh, teaching, I mean, assessment uh, methods. Mm -hmm. So then you look at what we have and you say, look, this seems to have served us, mm -hmm. but we need a new way of offering these experiences. And the last bit then is um, we have been dealing with a certain set of values. Uh, these have served us to an extent, but there are still gaps that probably require that we are exposing our learners to a different set of values. So yes, what is new is that there will be some new content, so to speak. Mm. There will be some new approaches to offering that content to learners mm. <coughs> and uh, new sets of values. Uh, probably not entirely new, but you look at what you've been offering and you say there is a gap here that requires that we put more emphasis. So the newness mm. could be on the emphasis that you are placing on a particular matter. And if you allow me to just get into this, just to you know reiterate what you said, uh, take the area of language, uh, which you guys are very familiar with, and I mention that because uh, I'm a teacher of language, basically. Uh, the, the parts of speech will largely remain the same. <laughs> Adjectives, <laughs> verbs, nouns, pronouns. <laughs> so then the question you ask is, what is new? What is new is, what do we want our learners to do with our language and therefore, what content do we give emphasis? Okay. How do we offer them? How do we assess to be able to realize that these people can demonstrate that they are able to apply that knowledge in a workspace? Okay. So then from, from what I gather from what you're saying now, is that nothing was being overhauled per se, <coughs> and nothing incredibly new was being introduced, but that there are improvements mm -hmm. being made and that there are gaps essentially yeah. that are being filled. Yeah. And what we are trying to do with learners today is mm -hmm. then be able to see how they apply these mm -hmm. concepts that mm -hmm. they are being taught. Is that the reason then now why we see a lot more activity around learning, which a lot of times parents have complained about that they are then being pulled into this whole circus of having to, mm -hmm. you know, assist. I already see it. It's 80% student or learner based and then 20% mm -hmm. parent assisted. Mm -hmm. Is that why we then see this increased flurry of activity, especially then uh, in the lower to uh, upper primary? Exactly. You've put it so well. In fact, I, I start wondering why you invited me here. You would have talked about this. <laughs> <already>. <laughs> <coughs> the, uh, and it's important that we demystify this to the country, that uh, we are not saying everything that was 844 is bad. Throw it away into the dustbin. Mm. And if you go further, because you had asked me to talk about even pre-independence uh, and so on, we are not mm. saying that everything even was there before it, uh, that 844 was bad, throw it away. Mm. I can't put it in better words than Ndu has put it. That we are saying, hang on, in 1982, when we last decided on the set of subjects we shall offer our learners, we may have missed out emphasis on environmental studies. Mm. Okay, just mm -hmm. an example. Mm -hmm. We may have missed out emphasis on science or 
we package that science in a way that we were just looking at learners recalling what they were taught in class. Mm. Or there are issues we now know about science that we did not know then that are relevant to bring to the picture. Mm. And then coming to what Ndu is saying, uh, one of the big things we realize, the gaps, is that over years we have zeroed into just one approach to learning, assessment. Mm. And if you get A from that assessment, you are a clever person, you go to university and <laughs> we employ you ask. here, then we discover <laughs> that actually you don't have the competencies we required. Mm. So then we say there must be a new way of assessing our learners. But let us not wait for that new way of assessing them. Let us introduce sets of programs, activities, experiences mm. that involve other people around the child also. Mm -hmm. Hence, uh, what Ndu is saying that now we are even saying, uh, can we have even parents getting involved in what learners are doing? Mm -hmm. Can we have a bit more activity than just uh, Eric Latte going to class and saying good morning, then the poor children are saying good morning, sir, mm. and then you ask them, do you understand? And they say yes, sir, even <laughs> when they have not understood a thing. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's why we are saying that is the newness. Mm. And um, but a key issue, and this takes me back to City's question, mm. it is the word competency that I think Kenyans have been wondering, grappling. What is yeah. this new competency? What we have done now is to decide what are these sets of, I gave you long terms, like earlier on, skills, I mean knowledge, skills, attitudes and values, just let's call it competence. What are these sets mm. that we want our graduates of our school system to have? We, that's where we, that's something we missed. That uh, if you think about pre-independence, uh, I'm sure CT, you 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 have a, had a, a <laughs> bit more, a bit more history about that. Mm. Yes, I was alive in the previous century. <laughs> Pre-colonial. Yes. <laughs> if you analyze the education we had at that time, mm. actually we had a curriculum. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was a curriculum. Yes, uh, BT John, who has written a pencil about this, calls it the African traditional education. Mm. Yeah. It was basically apprentice based. You learned at the feet of people who already knew. Uh, what to do. Mm -hmm. And that meant something. By the time you finished the, some set of knowledge, skills or competencies, you were able to function. Because yes. apart from just sitting at their feet yeah. and knowing what they know, yes. you were able to do what they did. Yes. yes. And the philosophy behind it. Yes. Mm. Because uh, including the proverbs you talk about, yes. you sat at the feet of people who were able to talk these proverbs and probably were able to explain to you the context of that proverb. Mm -hmm. So that when you use it later, you're not using out of context. Mm -hmm. um, then come independence time. Mm -hmm. You know, by 1964, we had all sorts of curricula in this country, mm -hmm. depending on where the missionaries who brought us education came from. Mm -hmm. If they came from Scotland, if they came from uh, uh, elsewhere, <laughs> they brought different sets of the curriculum. And remember, Ominde and his team captured it well, that our focus as a country then was to eradicate poverty, uh, uh, disease and ignorance. Mm. But there's something else. We needed a quick labor force mm. that would replace the, 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 the colonialists and other people that we were sending away. Mm. So our curriculum was quickly cobbled, but Ubinde Commission put sense into it and gave us what was called the 7423. Uh, mm. mm. But colleagues, if I ask you here, what was this one technical name we were calling that curriculum? It didn't have a name, actually. It did have a name. But what, I, what I had a name was yeah. the exams yeah. that you sat mm -hmm. at, at certain intervals. Yeah, those mm -hmm. were the names. Yes. But analytically, as a, I mean, an educator would tell you, yeah. it was largely a knowledge-based curriculum. Why knowledge? Nobody wanted to go into edu education that would soil their hands, if mm. you remember. You know, you needed to dress like me to yeah. demonstrate that you've gone to school. <laughs> <laughs> if you are working in Nairobi, you are yes. in some office yeah. where you have a chair and maybe a cup of tea and most likely yeah, you drive a car. And, yeah. and you have yeah. a newspaper. And if you came where I came from, you are able to buy a record player. <laughs> <laughs> you come to the village and people can listen to music. <laughs> and <laughs> that is an important person. <laughs> yeah. There were only a few people and a mm. few schools mm. who went to places called technical schools. Mm. And they were not quite respected, you know. 
the, the, the typical definition of the people in technical school was the apron. You know, the, mm. Mm. The, yeah, where I come from, they call it a name. I don't want to call on on, on, on camera. Mm. Yeah, but it just defines that, you know, that. So we did not have a name for it. Now mm. come 1985, mm. and uh, President Moi forms the Presidential Working Party on the establishment of the second uh, national university in Kenya. They did a good job. They gave mm. us a second university, which I went to and I associate with. I'm actually a professor of Moi University. Mm. Uh, we call it the, the University of the Difference. Mm. Uh, we still like mm. it. Mm. It was the only one that was built from the scratch. But in recommending the establishment of that university, one of the gaps they identified was low transition of people to the university. Mm -hmm. So quickly they abolished the A-levels. Uh, some people used to call it the Kamodo Advanced Certificate of Elimination <laughs> because <laughs> not many people proceeded. <laughs> then we had to do something with the two years of A-levels. Mm. So we added one to the university. Mm. So from three to four years, added one to class eight from seven to eight years. But I want to ask you colleagues, what name did we give that curriculum? Mm. We gave it a name based on <laughs> On the, the years, years of study, <laughs> exactly. uh, uh, yes, and we called it 844, eight, four, 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 but yeah. we did not actually name it. There was nothing descriptive about that particular yeah. system. Mm. Exactly, and mm. those are numbers, mm. those are just a structure. Mm. Just like now we have the competency-based curriculum, mm. but ca uh, the structure is two years of pre-primary, uh, six years of primary, mm. and also uh, three years of junior school mm -hmm. three years of and three years school. of senior school mm -hmm. and there's a science behind those numbers of years which mm -hmm. maybe we shall have time to come to but the point i'm making now is that as a country we did not really think about technically because these are things which are documented they have been written on since plato 1910 and mm -hmm. even before what is this philosophy because that name defines the philosophy of what you want analytically though from the experience that took place you'd call it a skills-based curriculum mm -hmm. Because Eight, four, if you four. remember, mm. uh, city people are supposed to leave school being able to make pots, yes, mm. uh, being able to make stools, mm. being able to make ropes. Mm. Somebody was supposed to leave that school system, being able to do something. You had a skill. Yes, you had a skill. Even sewing, yes. new running stitches, and yeah. hemming mm -hmm. stitches. And, yeah. Then yes. what did we Kenyans do? It was too much. Too much. We are, we are begging our children, yeah. you know, do things that the people who have gone to school should not do. Yeah, sure. And in 10 years, mm. from 1985, actually not even 10, to 1992, KIE, which I now stay in as, as KICD, mm. was called upon, can you start changing these things? It's too much burden on our children. But there was a reason behind it. If you read McKay's report mm. that brought us 844, they actually say in their own preface, that uh, they didn't have enough time to really conceptualize the curriculum. And therefore, their re uh, recommendations on the curriculum should not be taken very seriously. <laughs> In their own words. <laughs> and they still said grades standard 7 and standard 8 should be looked more as vocational. Because what was happening then is that we still accepted as a country something we should all be going to jail for. That there are some learners who just leave standard 8 and their education stopped there. Mm. So they were saying that they were joining the, the world of work. Mm. Anyway, to cut a long story, uh, that was a skills base, but we watered it down. And by 1992, uh, Latte, we had just gone back to knowledge, 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 and they had dropped all those skills based yep. Yep. learning areas. Mm. And fast forward, what became important was what grade you got how much you could recall mm. what you had learned in school. Mm. And we started carrying children shoulder high mm. uh, and celebrating the 10,000, actually not even 10, who would qualify for university. I forgot about all this. Mm. Everybody but else. there is something about that curriculum. Hence the newness. Mm. It was so rigid. For you to pass that curriculum up to university, you had to be good in at least five subjects where you get B. Mm. Mm. If you got anything less than B, English, mathematics, Kiswahili, two sciences, and mm. one humanity. Mm. So it doesn't matter that you are wired to be an artist. Mm. That's your problem. Yes. You must it didn't have two matter sciences. that, you are like me, mm. you are a language person. 
if if you go, if I had gone to school during it, I don't think I would have been where I am now. <laughs> it didn't matter that uh, <laughs> you look at yourself and you were more of a STEM person. You are a science person. You still had to pass the languages and pass and them them. well. Mm. So one of the few things that this curriculum has brought on board is flexibility. Can we give learners an opportunity to pursue that in which they have demonstrated potential, in which they have demonstrated competencies based on the continuous assessment, not a one-off paper that you do when you are sick and you are gone. So, bring it where we are, this is the first time, uh, City, that this country sat down to say, look, we now need a curriculum that we can give a name. Around, we, we need to identify the set of competencies that will take us to, mm. to look at my level today, Vision 2030. Mm. And it didn't come from a vacuum. President Waikibaki formed uh, a task force mm. to align the Kenyan education system to the Constitution 2010, led by one of the most celebrated professors in this country, Douglas Odeambo. And these people had a good time to go around the country to benchmark, and they have one of the best reports you can mm. talk about. Did you know, City, that Mackay only had 16 days to go around this country to get Kenya's views? And give us the 844. I knew he had a short time, yeah. because at the time the Mackay report was coming out, I myself was a teacher. Ah. Yes, and I was also a teacher of languages, the English you language. You have taught me. The likelihood exists, yes. Mm. <laughs> 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 Let's take a break at this point. We'll continue this conversation shortly. 27 minutes to 9. <laughs> Professor Charles Ongondo is the CEO of the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development. He's the man in charge of rolling out the CBC curriculum as we progress from now the current grade 8s as they go into 9, into 10. Like that, like that. 2, 6, 3, 3. Yes. And you said there's a philosophy behind mm -hmm. the 2, the, the 6, the 3, the 3. Yes. You'll tell us about that after this break. Keep it here. We'll be back shortly. This is the Situation Room. The only way to start your day. Welcome to BBS Mall, the ultimate shopping destination in East and Central Africa. With over 1,500 retail outlets, thousands of parking slots, and more than 30 eateries, there's something for everyone. Enjoy our conference and expo facilities, kids' play area, and soon-to-come attractions like bowling and the gold souk. Plus, this Ramadan, we're proud to announce the opening of a majestic masjid accommodating over 2,000 worshippers, conveniently located, reachable within 20 minutes from anywhere in Nairobi. BBS Mall, unleash your shopping desires. I've got a plan to make my investment season hotter <laughs> than a Sunday barbecue grill. ICEA Lion has a plan for everyone. Talk to us today for a plan that's right for you. Or visit icealion.co.ke. ICEA Lion. What's your plan? Uh, sunny morning in Nairobi at 17 degrees and we're looking at 18 and sunny in Nakuru. 18 and sunny in Nyeri with 16 and sunny conditions in Eldoret. 21, or rather, um, looking at uh, 30 and sunny conditions in Mombasa. And at 30, it's sunny in Malindi as well. Kisumu sunny at 22 and Kakamega at 21. Sunny conditions through and through. It's 20 and sunny in Kampala and 29 and sunny in Dar es Salaam. 21 sunny conditions in Johannesburg and Mogadishu is 30 and sunny while Addis Ababa at 16 is sunny this morning. It's 27 and sunny in Lagos, rather cloudy in Lagos at 27 and cloudy at 25 in Kinshasa. Here we are Spice up your life. Uh, heavy traffic coming off of Lower Kabete and joining with whatever is coming up off of the Red Hill Link Road. That is still extremely busy this morning. And you're coming into the city from Limuru Road, joining with Red Hill on the other side. So it's one whole network of a complicated mess this morning and traffic is moving very 
um, slowly. So coming off Lemuru, touching with what's coming off of Wangari Mathai, and all of this coming off of Thika Superhighway. And there's Kiambu Road, well past Karura Gate C today. I don't know what's going on and why it's so heavy, but uh, that's what it looks like coming there. And Landis Road now is bumper to bumper from the City Stadium roundabout out towards the Kamkunji roundabout. And uh, Langata Road not looking so bad anymore, but Rilo Dinga Way is still taking off some of that traffic heading into the city. All right. On altering, not too bad. We'll get to the thicker superhighway junction without an issue. We'll keep an eye on things as traffic progresses through Wednesday. And let's talk on Spice FMKE on X hashtag The Situation Room. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice All FM, right. Nairobi. Tonight, our conversation with Professor Charles Ngondo, the CEO of the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development, continues. So, Prof, 2633. Yes. After you've given us the history and the journey towards mm -hmm. here and mm -hmm. the, the the thinking behind, let's have a curriculum that, first of all, we can even put a name. Yes. Because the name shows the philosophy behind the mm -hmm. curriculum. Right. And then now we have the 2633. Why are they important? Why are those years important? Yes. Uh, a big name to invoke here mm -hmm. is um, somebody called uh, Cognitive Piaget. Cognitive developmental theory. The years have to match the developmental milestones of the children who are the targets of the learning system. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the pre-primary, where we do two years. One, we are saying the child should go to school when they are four years old. At that age, they are formed mentally, uh, physically, and socially to be able to start doing something. Mm -hmm. Interaction and sharpening their interaction skills. Uh, because they have been at home, mm -hmm. where we call them sweet names, you know, you are my grandmother, grandfather. Mm -hmm. They are not, uh, sometimes <laughs> even run away from other people. Mm -hmm. So they have to start to learn to interact with others. Yeah. But they just need two years to do that. And the only thing they need at that point is basic literacy, numeracy, very, very basic, just to be able to know the environment around them. Mm. Then come age uh, six, Again, scientifically, and scientists uh, who have read the brain of the human being have told us at that point now, they can start engaging in another step, socialization. But uh, these are basic socialization skills. They need to know, uh, socialize the people around them, mm -hmm. socialize with the environment around them. At that time now, Eric, they know about clouds. Mm -hmm. They know about the, you know, environmental control, conservation. Mm -hmm. They know about farms. They know about lakes, rivers, and so on. Cows and goats. Yes. But that, mm -hmm. there, and then in terms of language, the child at that stage really is not yet being made into an academic. And although our society puts pressure on them, and sometimes you talk to a grade one child, you ask them what they want to do, and they tell you, I want to be a pediatrician, I want to be a neurological <laughs> engineering. <laughs> Technically, that child simply needs to be able to socialize the right environment and get sufficient introduction to formal learning. Mm. But that should not go on beyond age 11. And this, as you know, this assigned to age 11. Age 11 now, uh, the child is beginning to have formations that transform them from being children to being adults. Mm. Uh, that's when they are getting to the famous the adolescent stage. Mm. They are getting into the most troublesome age of human life, mm. age 11 to age 15, mm. right? Mm. Other than the physical formations, our voices have changed. The mind changes quite electronically. <laughs> One day you want to be an engineer, the next day you want to be a, a soldier, DJ. the third day you see a chef with a good cape and you want to be one. Uh, they are telling you, I know what I'm doing. Mm. You think they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> that is a child to be separated from the fellow who is just socializing, uh, who plays and goes home and doesn't even need to worry about exams. Mm. That's why we introduced junior school. Mm. At that time, the only way you can manage this child is expose them to a broad-based curriculum where they do a little of everything before they can make up their minds 
because they are not even very sure of where their interest is. In some countries, mm. they start early uh, at about grade four, mm. which would be about age eight. So that's why we introduced junior school, age 12, 13, 14, broad-based curriculum, mm -hmm. where you expose learners to all that they may encounter and they may have interest in. Before now, they are well formed. They have stabilized. At age 15, they start to stabilize even mentally mm -hmm. to be able to focus on now what we call a pathway at senior school, which is another three years. And this research tone. Mm -hmm. uh, long ago, the World Bank sponsored a study called um, Africa at the Crossroads. Uh, what does the Trans-Saharan Africa want in terms of education? And they said, have a longer secondary school period, but divide it into two, give people time when they can have a test of everything and then time to start to specialize in. So now, the junior school, I talked about interaction mm. for pre-primary, mm. socialization for primary. Junior school, give it one word, exploration. A curriculum that provides learners an opportunity to explore. In fact, uh, in terms of pedagogy, mm. that is all the kind of learner whom you want to listen and just partake what you are saying mm. and assess. That's the learner you give time to do things. Active. Yes, active. In fact, if you think about a grade 7 child, if you have one or one is around you, the curriculum is made in such a way that we want them to be able to do. Uh, now, then senior school, pre-career. We don't want to tell you you are serious. That's why we give them long trousers in school. <laughs> you are now a gentleman. <laughs> you are start to think like a scientist if you are one. Mm -hmm. If you want to think, uh, go into humanities and languages, start thinking like one. And start there for reading more, mm -hmm. exploring more, doing more about that area. And then at age 12, I mean at age 18, which is consistent with where that ends, even the Kenya constitution says you are an adult, you love an identity card and you can now go to the university where you can now be in charge of, of what you want. And this, just that we don't have much time, this has been written on, if, if you take language where we uh, sit at I, at most of you operate, we can take you down mm. to what a learner at age, age six is able to do with their tongue, with the back of their mouth, mm -hmm. what are they, they are able to pronounce, what is it they can't pronounce, We'll be able to take it to the analytical capabilities of the child to be able to tell you, yes, we don't want this child, for example, to read a novel of more than 150 pages. Mm. They are impatient. Mm. By the time they have done 50 pages, they want doing something else. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so the science has documented the years. And uh, Douglas Odiambo, in their report, because these people I told you had enough time to you know, read and so on, says in their own words, no, no, we have no business keeping a child in primary school beyond um, six years. And uh, there is no reason we should then have somebody specializing at age 12. Give them some time to, to try everything. In fact, they are the people who initially recommended we should have two, six, three, three. It is in, in their document. Mm. But I think I want to add something else. Go and do your research. You people are experienced uh, journalists. Which other country in the world keeps children in primary school for eight years? Up to the other day, we were only three countries in the world competing with people like Southern Sudan, mm -hmm. uh, who, who have also moved on. The rest of the world, the highest people spend in primary school is about seven years. And it is because of these scientific reasons. But we are there. We, we, we had that history mm. that took us there. So we don't want to blame it. Mm. We, there was a reason people thought about it at that time. But now, it's time to improve that and go on to something else. Prof, I mean, I hear you. And I think, look, on, honestly, um, I think very few times have we heard it explained in this manner. That this is the reason why the numbers would have been skewed a little bit here and there. Because it rhymes with physiological, mm -hmm. psychological development in a child. And say, okay, fine. And cognitive. And cognitive. Yeah. So skew your education mm -hmm. to how this child is developing. Mm -hmm. And so it makes sense. Yeah. My issue is... Yeah how it is being delivered mm -hmm. because somebody's got to deliver it yes. there's got to be infrastructure within which this thing this, the, the carriage of it mm -hmm. for me is the problem yes that how are we assuring quality mm -hmm. of the tutors and teachers mm -hmm. who are then meant to deliver this mm -hmm. who unfortunately in a lot of cases and i'm sure you will agree mm -hmm. are still stuck in the era whereby mm -hmm. the only way i know you've learned is if you pass an exam mm -hmm. 
And here we are saying, I want you to be able to be active and, you know, yeah. and, we, and then we're not <laughs> even able to decipher what an active child looks like. Yeah. An active child is going to be told to stand in the corner and put their hands up because mm. they're making mm. noise. Mm. Meanwhile, this curriculum is asking you mm. to, to see that as something else. Yeah. So how do we deliver this thing, which in my mind is mm. brilliant, yes. but unfortunately the vanguards of the mm. delivery mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are not uh, up to scratch. Very, very, very good questions, uh, Ndu. And this, this, these are the questions Kenyans should be asking. Um, I'll break down your question to three things. One, infrastructure. And get back to cities, uh, proverb when he last visited Switzerland. Mm. From a curriculum developer's perspective, you have to be very visionary. Mm. <coughs> the child who is in grade seven now will leave the university somewhere around 2031, 2032. What skills, competencies do they want? Mm. Then I tell the country, we need this infrastructure. And because we live in this space, we have to appreciate that the country may not get us there in terms of infrastructure the same mm. day mm. or even the same month. But if we don't dare tell this country that we will need a computer or a desktop or some other digital material, they will not think about it. Mm. It will not even be the, the, the budget or the plan. Mm. So I have, as a curriculum developer with my team, to tell the country this is what we need. And I can tell you we are getting there. Uh, maybe you will ask me a question later about materials, which, which, which is good. Mm. Um, but then the tutors, the question with the quality of teaching is because of the context the teachers found themselves in. We found ourselves in a context where, as you say correctly, what was important and which I'll be judged by and probably promoted is how far my students pass exams. Mm. As long as we refocus yeah. and say now what should be our focus and what therefore shall we be promoted on, the teachers will change. Because I'll tell you something. These teachers we produce in Kenya, I'm a teacher educator, mm. and I've had a small stint in uh, Britain uh, to teach. The teacher is actually prepared to have one default teaching methodology, learner-centered method. Mm. And if you go to any school even now and you come across a teacher on teaching practice, the marks are awarded on the basis on the extent to which they have put the learner on the seat. Mm. And they have just become a guide by the side, not a sage on stage. Mm. But because over time, we told the teacher, no, 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 what matters here, my friend, is how you drill, drill and drill and produce this. Yeah. And I want to tie it with what uh, one of you asked earlier. We initially packaged this curriculum, the way we talked about it, as if we were overhauling, as if we were rejecting, as if we were saying everything was bad. And because of that, we got into an attitudinal problem, where even among us, Kenyans, people said, no, no, then this thing is not right. Mm. You know, it can't just wake up and say everything about it is bad. So as long as we sort out the issue of exams, which we have, mm. we are now saying, like in primary school, 60% of what the learners will be graded upon is based on what they do continuously with the teachers. Projects, experiments, uh, activities, then that attitude will change. Mm. The teacher does not need to go to college again to be totally trained because the teacher is already trained purely on learner-centered pedagogy. And I can tell you our teachers teach in other spaces mm. in this world. Uh, some of these people we, we celebrate as teaching in international schools where we take our children, they are Kenyan teachers, <laughs> Kenyan trained teachers, and they know what to do. Yeah. yeah, but because the environment, the context in which they're operating allows them to teach using those methodologies. So I think just to assure Andu here, we have not appreciated as a country even how much infrastructure, but for me, let me call them educational materials. Mm -hmm. The correct word actually is curriculum support materials. We have put into that space. One of these days come into the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development, for example, and you'll find that we have digital materials that are not anywhere else in this uh, Africa other than Egypt and South Africa mm. that every mm. learner can access regardless of where they are in this country mm. in any learning area and will take them through step-by-step -step way of learning. Mm -hmm. uh, this country has made an effort, as, as anybody else would start, in making 
a learning text in every subject for every learner. So if your child in a public school today at grade 8, they will have 14 books that they are exposed to. Yeah. And the books have been made in such a way mm. that they promote hands-on learner-centered learning. Mm. And we are now saying, beyond the books now, mm. can we get to a point where uh, learners, because the digital you know, revolution is with us here now, mm -hmm. now are able to do things like, let me just give you a quick example and then I shut up. A mobile laboratory, no, sorry, a virtual laboratory. Can we now say that learners can sit anywhere and virtually be able to, to, to conduct yeah, experiments, mm -hmm. be able to dismantle a computer mm. virtually mm. and be able to start learning about why does this part do here? Be able to dismantle the human heart virtually or whatever other experiment that they are able to do. Mm. Be uh, if, if we cannot do the physical one, which we have been concentrating on, you know, we are still thinking about which school has, which laboratory and so on. But the digital space has told us this is possible. And this is one of the things that KICD and the Ministry of Education is working towards. Mm. Uh, so that then, uh, if we can't buy the hardcore material, we still give the learner an opportunity to be able to manipulate their environment. And that's where the world is. Uh, so the world we can is. all access it. Exactly. <clears throat> Prof, there's been this huge, huge, huge concern. Yes. That one of the things that this the rollout of CBC is doing is it's <clears throat> supporting those in the publishing industry mm -hmm. that you know because now when you go into grade seven you're required to have x number of books you just talked about like 13 books and those 13 books by the time you're getting to term three you need an, another set of do you how many books you go to grade eight different ones you can't even hand down these 13 books that you used in grade seven to the next grade seven because there'll be different ones mm -hmm. what do you say to that is kicd yeah. changing the books that are required too often too regularly you know what i'm, I'm very happy with uh, this invitation because you've given me a moment to clarify uh, some of these myths one like now the children are in grade eight uh the his excellency the president ruto as you know formed a presidential working party on education reforms mm -hmm. and they went around the country we listened to them you you gave them airtime one of the things they said was that uh, the parents were already complaining, as we did earlier on, that there were too many learning areas and mm. the bugs were heavy again with the books and so on. Uh, as that was happening, the Institute, of course, through a multi-agency arrangement, had already conceptualized that junior school would have 14 learning areas. We had already procured books, and the books, once procured, the lifetime of a book is five years. So when we buy a book, much as we say we are buying for the learner, it stays at school for the next five years. Mm -hmm. But then, the Presidential Working Party said two things. One, rationalize the learning areas. The word sometimes Kenyans have used is reduce. We are mm. not reducing. <laughs> rationalize. That means, look back at that science. You have another learning area called health education. You have another one called life skills. And see if you can integrate so that we don't have on paper too many learning areas. Okay. Now, what that means is that it calls for another set of books. But what the government has done is, we are saying, no, what we shall do is review the curriculum design. But the books we have out there already will still serve. And I'll give you three examples. We have a learning area now that we call creative arts. We have put together uh, physical education and sports, mm -hmm. aspects of it. Uh, fine arts, or what was called visual arts and performing arts. Mm. The books are out there in those learning areas. But we are saying we shall have a curriculum design so that teachers that can draw content from these books when it's necessary. So, a book, to clarify, once bought by the government, has a lifespan of five years. In fact, right now, the Ministry of Education has authorized us to call for books for grade one, two, three and four, which we last supplied in 2019. 2019. Mm -hmm. And the teachers have reported, you know, those are children. Books are torn, they, they are worn out, and so on. Prof, let me just get you right. Yes. What <coughs> you're saying is that the physical life span of a book, yeah. five years. Not the yeah. content. That, yes, <coughs> book. Mm. I'll go back there. It coincides with the the, the technical <coughs> lifespan of our curriculum. So, yes, 
after four years the book is torn and we won out. But it is also time to look at that content and think whether there are certain adjustments that need to make. And that's a UNESCO rule. That every country after five years you need to relook at your curriculum and your curriculum support materials and review them. So that fa functions for us. Why? Yeah. Five years. Five Why years. Why not six? Why not three? Uh, well, this is research, based on research uh, worldwide. And uh, a study data by UNESCO far back in 2005 uh, analyzed and said, generally speaking, in five years there has been sufficient change in uh, global historical developmental uh, spaces to warrant a relook at the curriculum. I mean, agreement. <coughs> yes. Does it then not mean that when you have books, yeah. you should have a second edition of the book as opposed to a new book? Exactly. Actually, you got it right. Maybe I didn't miss the word. We are not necessarily saying we want a totally new book. What we are calling for is uh, a revision of that book. It's a new edition. But now, for uh, people who work in our space, mm. if, if you just lazily say, uh, city publishers, mm. you did for us uh, science for grade four. Mm. Just give us a new edition. You can guess what will happen. <laughs> so make it competitive. Because what KICD does, mm. when these teachers or publishers submit these books, mm. we, we form panels. Mm. One book is looked at by 15 people from different parts of the country who have not known one another. They don't know the book they are looking at. It is completely anonymous. One day I'll invite you to look at the manuscripts that we have. And you read it as an individual, mm -hmm. as an expert, and say, I've given this book 50 marks against a criterion. The five of you, five at any one time, come together and start a discussion. Why are you giving this book 90? Why are you giving it 80? And so on. Then another five people will look at it. So it's a, you know, a chain. Mm. So finally we say, these are the best books. And then when you have arrived at the books, we have met the threshold. And our threshold is very high. A book has to achieve at least 70% wow. to qualify for the next stage which is a financial bid. Mm. And that's where your question of whether we are making publishers rich comes in. Mm -hmm. It is purely a procurement law now, the lowest bidder. Once you've met the threshold, then we say now, submit your financial bid. Mm. And we'll go for the lowest bidder. Mm. And I'll give you an example. Just go out of this studio today in the so-called open market and ask for a grade 7 English language book in the market. Mm. They'll probably tell you it's about 700 shillings or maybe 800. And then ask me how much the government is buying that same book. That same book. Everything is the same mm. for the public schools. How much? 300 shillings. Oh. How yes. many books is the government buying at a go? Uh, about 1.2 million. Uh, precisely. Yeah, because... So economies of scale. Exactly. Mm. But now it is cheaper. Much, much cheaper for the government right. and for the parent. Mm. And uh, actually, publishers have been really complaining that we, we are really Prof, <laughs> 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 yeah. thank you very much for joining us. You've explained, somebody says, I have never heard this new system explained so well. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing that. Allow me to say just one thing, mm. because it's critical confusion there. Mm. And I think one of the things you asked me to say, officially, as far as I'm concerned, and uh, I think I listen to my CS and my PS every day, mm. Grade 9 is still housed within the primary school spaces alongside grade 7 and 8. Seven, there is no eight, official nine. position mm. as is being peddled out here that grade 9 is going to secondary school. Somebody asked me that as I was coming here, that you are going to Spice FM. Can you clarify? And I needed to say that for the sake of my constituency. So <laughs> ten, 10 is where you move. Senior school. To senior school. Yes. To 7, 8, school. 9 is junior school. In fact, we no longer call it junior secondary. It's just junior, junior school. school. Mm. Yeah. So schools have to start building that classroom? Yeah, no, the government will. Okay. Yeah, uh, well, unless they are private schools. Sawa. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Charles Sangondo is the CEO of the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development. He's been our guest. Thank you very much, Prof, for, for, for joining us. News time. Here's a setto. So deep following a massive crackdown that saw detectives recover dozens of suspected stolen phones, laptops and tablets in various parts of Nairobi. Director of the Criminal Investigations boss, Mohamed Amin, said the region-wide operation targeted suspicious phone repair stores, he said. The swoop that followed 
as such in the theft of electronic gadgets netted over 182 mobile phones a laptop an ipad and two heating machines in the rai and kamulu areas he said five suspects found with the suspected stolen items were arrested three suspects were arrested at the two spots now the crackdown netted several other suspects in langata including two who were in possession of 34 suspected stolen phones two other suspects who were found with eight suspected stolen phones were also arrested in the same area now land's cabinet secretary Alice Wahome has ordered the surrender of an eight acre piece of land in Loresha to Ashok Kumar the owner the CH spoke into the land at the heart of a prolonged court battle which ended in favor of Kumar CS Wahome gave a 24 hour ultimatum to the Gigiri OCPD to drive out unknown persons who have been occupying the land and who during the course of CS's visit attempted to block access to the parcel of land and Busia Senator Kiom Tata has cautioned his own as continued rather his onslaught against President William Ruto's claims that the implementation of the affordable housing levy won't be interrupted by court orders. Okia says that's important for the president to obey the law as when his term ends he can still be charged for such crimes. Ultimately, private property must be protected, must be respected, and the owner of private property, which includes salaries, must have the freedom to use their salary the way they choose. We are not a communist state or anything. So I think uh, the president has got no option but to obey the law. And we are going to ensure he follows the law, or he becomes irrelevant. And if he does things against the law, when he leaves power, we shall jail him. How many presidents have gone to jail? So President Ruto should not think that he says he's a god. I know he has changed his style of dress. That means nothing to some of us. He just follows the law or we deal with him. Omtata at the same time has called on President Ruto to come clear on the difference between Bomayango program as well as the affordable housing program. All over the world, there's nowhere where you can take money from one person to build a house for another person. And we must distinguish between home ownership and access to housing. Article 43 prescribes that the state shall provide access to housing. And access to housing is basically rent. If you are building from the taxes we pay, if they took, took a section of the taxes and began building houses on public land to rent out to the public, and the houses remain owned by the government, so that people who, have, who cannot afford the portion or whatever, but they give them decent housing, you go there and pay affordable rent, just maybe for maintaining the houses, that's what access to housing is. Now, Sports Principal Secretary Engineer Peter Toom was at pains at Parliament to explain how the government will implement the Talanta Sports City Stadium meant for use during the 2027 Africa Cup of Nations. Members of the Parliamentary Committee on Sports questioned the PS on what exactly will be the role of the military in the rollout plan. The PS even failed to disclose just how much the project would cost and what will be source of the money. Days after President William Ruto broke the ground for 60,000 fund stadium, there remains more questions than answers as to the rollout plan and financing. Members of the sports committee are keen on how much the project will cost and the source of the funds. Now, Israel will allow as many Muslim worshippers to access Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem during the first week of Ramadan as in previous years, according to the Prime Minister's office. Every year, tens of thousands of Muslim worshippers perform Ramadan prayers at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Ramadan comes this year as Israel wages a relentless military campaign in the Gaza Strip in response to a deadly attack by Hamas in Israel on October 7, 2023. Israel has been assessing how to address worship in Jerusalem during Ramadan, the Islamic fasting month due to start on March 10th or 11th, depending on the lunar calendar. This is Newswire. I'm Dennis Alceto. Good morning. Four point four Spice FM, Nairobi. All right, a few minutes after nine o'clock, and um, so it's been a busy morning in the city, and I think we're just coming to the end of it. Uhuru Highway is now taking off. Everybody's getting into the city. The thicker superhighway, much, much better. Um, now that traffic seems to have dissipated quite some, and then also coming off of Kambu Road, we still have some of that uh, here and there. Limuru Road is busy, and also traffic coming off Waiaki Way that spilled over towards um, the Red Hill Link Road is still continuing, and that's going to be heavy joining with Kuna Road in a while. So that still continues. It's still heavy here and there. We're going to keep um, an eye on things as we do come towards the end of traffic hour. We'll speak on Spice FM, KE on X, hashtag the Situation Room.
This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is the Situation Room, so, what's the, plan? the only way to start your day. Yeah. Then I tell you where to go. Okay. Or you just tell me that you have a plan. Okay. Or in this case, that you don't have a plan. Okay. So whether you have, whether you don't have, you want to know how it's going to happen. Okay. Then I tell you to go to ICA Lion, mm. right? Mm. You can log on to the website, you can send them an email, you can trot on down to the office and have a chat with them. Mm. Because as you are developing this plan, the people who can say, well, okay, this is great. Mm. Let's see how we can put it together. And it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. You can actually put something away for later. You want to go on a holiday? You want to, you know, do another course? Mm. You want to build a house? What is it that you want to do? Mm. Your plan can actually come to life if you talk to the folks at ICEA Lion and they'll help you to be able to sort that out. It's very important. Yeah. I would just open that plan.icelion.co.ke. We want to show our next guest, Peter Echessa, who has joined us in the studio. And he is the founder and group CEO of Borderless Trucking and Safe Truck Limited. So we show him the plan, and then we'll also tell him about Ecobank. Because this is borderless, Ecobank is also borderless. Mm -hmm. yes? Peter Echessa, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Kenya's Biggest Conversation. Thank you, Eric. Happened your killer kid who happens. Okay, including giving you your own plan <laughs> and telling you how you Let can actualize about it. your own plan. You see the website? See that? It's plan.icelion.co.ke. Okay, they say planning for personal growth and the joy of a successful and secure life is an opportunity for everyone. And I see a lion is here to help you do just that. That is for personal growth. I'm sure, Peter, as you founded this company, as you were thinking about the company and what you wanted to do with it, you were thinking, okay, I've got a plan. I'd like this to happen. It was also for your own personal benefit. You're not doing this at the entirely for the benefit of humanity and then you sit back and you don't enjoy the benefits of it, right? Absolutely. It's to enjoy the fruit. So talk to IC Lion. They'll help you now put in the money that you're making from this company into that. Then also, as you think of trading borderless, across the continent, Ecobank is the one bank that you need to think about. It's in 35 different African countries. 35. And outside of Africa, it's in the UAE, in China, in the UK, in France. See? 39. Imagine. Mm -hmm. And all of that, there's seamless banking, seamless connectivity. You operate your one account here, it's in shillings. And you also have your company on the other side of, let's say, pick a country in Africa. In Africa, South Africa. You are operating in South Africa. Too, you're also so. operating in South Africa. You have a uh, your branch in South Africa, and you have a RAND account in South Africa, and you're thinking of how to transact. You don't have to think of, okay, now first convert RAND to shilling, RAND to dollar, dollar to shilling. No. You just operate seamlessly. Their back end is strong enough. It seamlessly just does the conversions for you. And wherever you are, you're here and you're paying your guys in SA. Or you're in SA and you're paying your guys here. Seamless as well. Makes a lot of sense. Yep. It does. Doesn't yep. it? Yep. It does. They say a better way, a better That's Africa. Huh. Higher. One of those African countries which is within South Africa for a greater part. So how many countries are neighbor South Africa? Many. If, many. You, if you consider Lesotho, Lesotho also be neighbor. <laughs> Namibia. Very good. Quite a number. Very good. So think of a country that borders South Africa and Mozambique. Mm -hmm. Zim? No. But so Another one? Mm -hmm. Another one? You mentioned it earlier. So is it. There you go. Mm -hmm. That one. It changed name. 
It now has a different name. That's what I That's the That's one. That's what me. Yes. yes. <laughs> so it is telling us the A I need CT to is say silent. It. Listen to how it's called. Well, it's actually, it's actually it's written Eswatini, uh-huh. but it is, you begin with an S. The E is almost silent, so it's Swatini. Oh, I didn't know that. How do you That's how it's pronounced. I didn't either. Until I started looking at the Proverbs and I was informed. Mm. It's written Eswatini, but it's pronounced Swatini. Uh-huh. Yes. Swatini. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you learn something every day. Mm-hmm. Yes. Now the proverb. A man who says it cannot be done should not interrupt the man doing it. A man who says it cannot be done should not interrupt the man who's doing it. Hmm. Interpret this one for us. What's your interpretation? My interpretation is very simple. I mean, uh, anything human, anything that you see, uh, there's nothing impossible, basically. If you can't do it, there's somebody who will do it. So Mm. don't get in their way. Mm. Yeah. You put it very well. (laughs) You put it very well because it is true. The fact that you can't do something, it means you can't do it. It doesn't mean it can't be done. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Somebody else might be able to do that very thing that you cannot do. Yes. Step aside. No, just step aside gently. Please. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> gently. Not this stand in the corner and don't look back thing. No, mm. Just step aside. You might learn something. And when you step aside, watch. You might learn how that person is doing it. And then you might also be able to do it. Mm. Yes. True. True. Borderless tracking and safe track. What is that? Yeah, technology companies. Uh, borderless tracking was registered to do a lot of public sector jobs, and specifically, uh, we did one major job, but that ended in 2019 with government policy change. Mm-hmm. Safe track specifically just deals with the private sector. Um, the main technology is in the field of IoT, Internet of Things. But now we've gone further and we're using technology to solve daily, day-to-day problems mm-hmm. in, the, in the country and in the continent. Mm. Yeah. Tracking, when you hear tracking, and it's not T-R-U-C-K, it's T-R-A-C-K. <laughs> it's a, we still put it into logistics. That you are sort of like tracking the movement of your fleet of vehicles or you're tracking the 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 what what your staff are doing is that it that is the basics uh, that's the beginning when you say tracking but when you start talking internet of things you're talking about interaction of devices mm. i mean when i take my remote control and point at the tv that's an interaction of one device to the other if i'm here and i'm able to control what's in my house through gsm network that's internet of things so you, you use that to then go further, not just uh, track and trace, but you start looking at the interaction and the movement and the security of assets, which is what we do. So we don't do vehicle tracking per se. We actually don't do that. We do, if we do fleets, uh, I mean vehicle tracking, we do only for fleet owners. What we specialize in, Why? Uh, because our kind of technology is a bit more pricey. Mm. to be able to do for individual cars. Are you suggesting <laughs> that people who own individual cars can't afford your tracking device? They can afford it, but that is not our target market. It's not because they can't, but mm. it's not our target market. Because we came to solve a problem mm. that many people are not able to, mm. to provide a solution for. Yeah. So what do you do? Personally or the company? The company. Because you have told us so, what you don't do. So what we do, we, we, we take technology from around the world. We don't innovate. Remember in Kenya, we don't have R&D budgets. Eh? So mm. we don't innovate. What we do is we take technology around the world, domesticate it, and then commercialize it. So let, let, me, let me take an example of uh, what bodiless tracking was doing. The regime of customs movement of cargo on the Northern Corridor was such that before 2010, when you had cargo container, for example, you had to get a customs officer, you had to get police to escort you. It used to take five to seven days for a container to leave Mombasa and reach 
Malaba. Mm. Now, what was the customs officer for is to ensure that the cargo is not diverted. The police is to ensure that the cargo is safe. Mm. And we said, if we use technology to provide a solution to this, where we provide visibility of the cargo to carry, then they don't have to be there because the cargo will not be diverted. If we are able then to provide electronic security on the container, then we don't need a policeman because mm. we will know if the container is open. Mm. So using te simple technology, GPS, which is normal, everybody has a phone, you know your location, we use GPRS for communication. Mm. And we then are able to put an electronic and RFID. RFID is the technology that you find in supermarkets. When you take an item, you don't pay for it, you come out, it makes a lot of noise. That's mm. the most common. So we attach that onto a container. So you know the location of the container. As it moves, you'll know it in real time. Number two, if the container door is open because you've locked it electronically, mm -hmm. you will know it's been open and then you're able to act. Mm -hmm. So we then were able to eliminate the issue of escorts and personnel, saving mm -hmm. costs and time, and made the Northern Corridor a very competitive corridor. Then later on, of course, the neighboring countries were able to uh, adopt it. Tanzania was second to adopt it. Uh, the Central Corridor mm. actually was involved in Tanzania as well on the launch mm. of the electronic um, cargo tracking system. So we do that kind of thing. We take technology and we, f we provide solutions that address our problems. What changed in 2019? Government policy. I mean, we were private companies providing solutions uh, to people to comply. So we would charge and we'd get paid and they comply and Kara was happy, everybody was happy. Government said now they want to do it themselves through Kenya Revenue Authority. So <laughs> <laughs> so now So they want to charge the people themselves. Um they financed or provide the technology. They provided the technology for free. Okay. Um and since then it's done by Kenya Revenue Authority. So government came in as a competition and then using no, regulation no, no, they, they out out competed you with regulation. They didn't compete with us. They actually because <laughs> we were licensed by them. Mm. So when they take over it means you stop being licensed so you really don't compete at all. Mm. Yeah. So then what spaces did that then create for you if they were taking over that aspect of um, the operation? Now, using the same technology, then you went to the private sector. Mm -hmm. So you go to manufacturers, for example. If you manufacture margarine and you want the movement of margarine, uh, you're distributing margarine across the country. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of theft of products across uh, the logistic sector. Mm -hmm. So we provide... You use the technology to provide security, visibility of uh, of cargo. Mm. Particularly, we started off with valuable cargo. Uh, most prominently, sugar, rice, coffee, and high-value manufactured goods. But now we do it right across uh, all products. So that, that, that was the formative years of bodily safe track, mm. 2016, when safe track started um, uh, we, we had foreseen that the government was angling to take over, so we said, let's start the private sector. Okay. Yeah. So you're here today, so we talk about fuel expenditure and reducing fuel expenditure carbon emissions and the thinking into the future. One of the big things that we're talking about now in the country is, a, you know, climate change and what we need to do to stop climate change. And one of the big contributors in climate change, we've said, is vehicles and planes and ships wherever they are they're contributing to the emissions yeah. Uh -huh. yeah this is our latest technology to deploy in the country now let me first of all be very clear when i start talking about this particularly to clients or bodies um, they ask me a lot of climate change questions i'm not an expert on that <laughs> I talk about the technology that aids in mitigating climate change effects. So we're looking at the issue, the two issues of fuel, how much fuel we use in the country and the benefits of using less fuel. Of course, one of the biggest benefits is you use less foreign exchange. To do that means you, there's a lot of mitigation factors that one can take. Mm -hmm. The second part is that all hydrocarbon engines they emit a lot of uh, what you call greenhouse uh, gases. Mm. Uh, mainly for health purposes, if I take an engine, you will get carbon monoxide emitted, you'll get a lot of nitrogen oxides emitted. Those are very bad for the health. But you also get carbon dioxide, which is not directly 
bad for the health, but it really has a big effect on global warming and basically climate change. Now, let's look at Kenya. We, we basically contribute less than 0.1% of the global emissions, but we are suffering, you know. Um, and Kenya, particularly the current government, is at the forefront of climate change. Uh, you know we hosted the Africa Climate Change Summit. Uh, the, the other day there was UNAIR. I think it's, it just ended last week and yep. so on. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, now, we're trying to plug in using technology to mitigate the factors of emissions. The technology we have, we, as I said, we don't innovate. Mm. This is a patented technology from Italy. Very interesting how it works. But we're looking at, first of all, we need to be able to reduce fuel usage. And that technology has been existing for quite a while. Mm. We do for all particularly vehicles and in the transport sector. What we look at is... If you've got a fleet of trucks, let's say from Mombasa to Kampala and back, you'll use about 900 um, liters, 1,000 liters to and fro. Now, if you use, if you monitor the usage of the vehicle, the drive with how the vehicle is driven, and then you start using the data that you generate from that to train your drivers to do better, then you start using less fuel. But uh, the savings that we've been able to get to our clients go up to 30, 40 percent. Mm -hmm. So first of all, we do we have to do monitoring so that you know what's going on. And we use the same technology that I talked about earlier. So we put in GPS, GPRS, and sensors. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so we put a sensor in the tank that will tell you the exact volume. The, what you see on the dash of your vehicle, the fuel gauge, mm -hmm. you'll see it from the comfort of your desk. Mm -hmm. So first of all, you're able then to know. The first thing you do is have a same type of bus or same bus will spend a lot more fuel if they're not very skilled. Mm. So that's the first thing you do. You use data to do that. Mm. Okay. Now, by monitoring that, we start off by saying, okay, we have now established what your consumption of fuel is. Mm. Then we come in with this technology that is cutting edge. Mm. A simple mechanical device that does a very simple chemical process. Um, it's been patented that when it shakes, it creates what you call electromagnetism that just breaks the bond. You know, what is fuel? Fuel is a hydrocarbon. C, O is the main thing, you know? And but that's oxygen and carbon. Mm. Now, complete combustion means those, those molecules separate and then they attach much better the carbon molecules attach much better than oxygen and then you get proper combustion mm. so you find a new car has no smoke and all the cars a lot of smoke mm. diesel cars in kenya particularly are notorious <laughs> for smoking <laughs> what you're seeing smoke as smoke is unburnt fuel mm. consi consi i mean it consists of various gases and particulate matter that are harmful to people harmful to the environment and so on now all the tests we've done and the people that we have actually uh, rolled out for, some of them public sector companies like KPLC, when I doing KTDA, we've done for Nakuru County. We've done for big companies, logistics companies like AGL, which is for Marie Bollore, Farmers Choice, Eden T, and so on. Um, when we've put in, and we've done a P we normally do POC first, a proof of concept. Mm. So we put in this device, and... We run, first of all, without putting in the device. So we measure the usage of fuel and mm. the emissions. And these are measured to international standards because we've got the instruments to do that. So you do what you call a baseline data. We establish the baseline data. What is the data before? And then we put in this device, and then we start monitoring again. Mm. Now, the savings on fuel, the highest we've gotten so far was 37%. And this was uh, one my tattoo will not mention the brand. Just repeat. Fuel saving of up to 37%. 7%. That was the highest we got. Meaning 37% of what previously they had actually used was now considered a saving. Absolutely. Hey. Okay. And this is because you've put this gadget, this thing, that yes. is a mechanical thing that's doing a chemical thing. Yes. I'll yeah. explain how it works okay. later. No, you told us that mm. chemical, chemical thing, you know, the CO, carbon, oxygen, yeah. full combustion, you know, uh -huh. efficiency, all that, please go on. And, and where, do you, where are you putting it? 
in, in the, the fuel tank? In the fuel tank. Okay. Yeah. Actually, right now we install it for how many clients? Uh, we're doing some installations at KPLC as we speak right now. The Mombasa big fleet of about 700 trucks. Um, our guys are there. They're doing installation. So can the ask, lowest. Yes, can I ask? ask the even as you proceed, it's really good. But is there a negative side to this process? I'll tell you okay. categorically no. And I'll explain why. Yes, please. A lot of the fuel saving solutions that have been in the market constitute their chemicals which you add in. Mm. They can actually repudiate your warranty and change a lot of things. Um, some of the fuel that you get that really gives you power, like if you go to a Shell Vivo station, they'll give you V power. Mm. Um, I don't know the I don't know the formula behind it, but I, because it's a liquid, I believe what they add in is a liquid to aid combustion. Our device is a mechanical device; it has no electrical connections or anything. Now, what happens is just like the diamond dynamo of your car, your, your your bicycle. When you ride your bicycle at night, the dynamo does through motion. It it's creates like, light. It's like a turbine. Mm. Uh -huh. Yes, which is exactly hydro. Yes. What hydroelectricity is. Yes. Water spinning. Uh, the the wheel and that. And the then you create, yes. yes okay. electricity. So by putting this device in the tank, and it's normally, we normally install it and just tie it mechanically onto the pump. Just, just to make sure that it's, it doesn't lie down. Because what we're looking for is vibration. When you vibrate it, it creates electromagnetism. So we do this even in generators. Smaller generators vibrate a lot. Our own generator, we've got a small uh, strip mall in Kilimani, our own, and we've got a 120 kVA generator. We put in and we've got 23% saving. If the bigger generators don't vibrate much, so we normally would put in an agitator to make sure there's vibration. Just by the process of vibration, it creates electromagnetism. And the patent is that the electromagnetism that is produced targets hydrocarbon molecules, so it separates them. Now, that's a patent, yeah? Mm. And that's what works. We don't know how it was patented, but we are commercializing it here. So because you're just putting in that, and it's just breaking down the hydrocarbon, it has a lot of positives. The first positive, of course, better combustion. Second positive, better consumption mean, um, combustion means you'll use less fuel. Now, if you are a diesel, you have a diesel engine, what happens when you have a lot of smoke? Your injectors get clogged, so you have to do service quite often. So it does, now you're burning better, so you actually start cleaning up your engine. And at the same time, of course, you're emitting a lot less. So it does not change, because we don't touch anything on the vehicle. We do not pour anything into the vehicle. It does not change the composition of the structure of the vehicle. So we have not had any side effect or any negative things that have been said about this. Can this thing be done at the point of refinery? Such that all fuel that comes to us has already been broken down. Maybe vibrate it in the refinery, break it down and give it to us. Uh, th that's, that's a product. Eric, that part, uh, that's, I think, chemical engineering that we don't have knowledge of, mm. which is why when you get fuel like V-Power, the famous V-Power, I do not know what they have done to make it have higher octane levels than normal premium. Mm. But it possibly, yes. Okay. Let's take a break. We'll continue this conversation shortly at 29 minutes to 10. Peter Echesa is the founder and CEO of Borderless Trucking and Safe Truck Limited. We are talking about fuel efficiency and what that does in terms of... Um, ni, ni, ni. <laughs> right? Just getting to understand what then we, we are talking about in terms of fuel efficiency and the environment and saving the environment and also... As a business, serving that shilling. Keep it here. We'll be back shortly. Good morning. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day.
the man who looks at a beautiful girl and doesn't talk to her will end up serving lunch at her wedding. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> City. Mm. Do like that. My father has killed a mouse. Will he fail to kill a man? I'm a wapanya. Small mammal, big mammal. Mtu <laughs> atamshinda. I mean, I don't understand. What, what well, are they how saying? How are we in I mean, he killed a mouse. What are they saying? What they're saying is, uh, my father has killed a mouse. <laughs> Will you fail to kill a man? <laughs> <laughs> name, surprise. Someone's name. The name I'm surprised you. No, the name is surprise. <laughs> no, what am I saying? I'm from Nigeria, man. I met somebody <laughs> called I Believe. So See? Nah, your name is I Believe. Yes, my name is I Believe. But that's the short form. I said, excuse me? I said, yes. My no name problem. is I Believe. So what's no, the fool? No, I believe in the goodness of God. <laughs> <laughs> the Situation Room. Kenya's biggest conversation. Okay, so let's see what happens as we come out of traffic hour this morning. Uh, just a little bit of that left as you come off of Waiaki Way and the Thika Super Highway. It's been a, a busy morning, but then getting out into the city now looks okay. Landy's Road is still packed. Looks like it'll be that way for a minute. And on Uhuru Highway, there's traffic going through towards the city and then out towards Westlands. Apart from that, we've not done too badly with traffic this morning. Keeping an eye on things through the day. Spice FM, KE on X. up your life mature intelligent talk every morning spice up yourself mornings okay, so you're a big company 94.4 spice of vehicles and you're using a lot of fuel every week every month and you're looking at your budget and you're thinking oh my goodness and um because of the fluctuation in the exchange rate and also because the OPEC guys have sit back and they decide kidogo, price of fuel keeps going up. So how do you address that? How do you make sure that there's benefit to your company? There's technology that's available that can help you with this. And that's what uh, Peter Chesa is here to tell us about. He's here to tell us about what you're doing already in the market. And you've, you're doing this for, for big fleets. When you say that you have realized a saving of, of a 30%, it's 30% saving on the amount of fuel consumed. Okay? Not necessarily 30% saving on your costs. Is that true? True. Okay. Before and after. So why can't it be 30% saving on cost? Um... It's uh, so many moving factors. Mm. Mm. So let me first, and because we're talking about fuel monitoring and fuel savings and emissions reduction. Mm. So we deploy two technologies to do this. Number one, we have to monitor the fuel usage and fuel consumption. Mm. So we put in fuel monitoring system before we install the savings device, which is why we say, once you start monitoring, because we don't want to get data given to us by people. Mm. We want to get data given to us by sensors mm. in terms of volume of fuel, field in, amount of fuel used by the vehicle. So we establish the baseline data, put it in. So, for example, if your truck that delivers uh, manufactured goods to Kisumu consumes um, 40,000 shillings worth of fuel, before we put in our device it will tell us how much for example it will say um it's consuming 16 i mean it's it's giving you uh three kilometers per liter okay or it is it's giving you four kilometers per liter then we put in this device so we get that data not from the human data that is collected manually mm. but from sensors mm. We will do that for a week or two. Then we put in the combustion optimizer. Using the same measuring tool, we will then be able to get the consumption. Mm. So you will find that when you do that, you may get now the increase from four kilometers per liter to possibly six, seven kilometers per liter. 
So there's a simple back of the envelope calculation that we normally do based on the data that we get from the census. Mm. Now, when you do that, it means, one, you now have visibility as the owner of a fleet of how much fuel is being used, not what you're being told is being used. Two, is that you can tell what the consumption is before and after. So it will directly translate, of course, to savings. If you're using 40,000 liter, 40, shillings, now you're going to use less because you're consuming less liters. Mm. So in a way, maybe I contradict myself here. In a way, yes, it translates to reduction of cost. Because if you're consuming less, of course, you're then paying less. Mm. And that's just how it works. Let me ask, when you say fuel, is it only petrol or is it also diesel? Anything hydrocarbon means petrol, diesel, diesel paraffin, you name it. Anything diesel hydrocarbon, fuels. yes. And anything that, any engine that burns, what you call in, internal combustion engine, generator, boat, generator, vehicles. You know where I'm going with this? Trains. Absolutely. Biggest consumer, big polluters. Because Absolutely. if I'm looking at what we have, say, for instance, the rail transportation, and given what it does and given what it's expected to do and given the frequency with which it actually travels and the amount of fuel that it consumes, then I look at the planes and I look at the frequency with which planes fly and just the amount of money that is spent on fuels. Comes the question now, do we have people who are in the airline business using this gadget? Do we have people who are in the rail transport business using this gadget? Not in Kenya, mm -hmm. but in Italy and Brazil, railway, yes. And airlines are a bit more difficult because to be able to access the airline tanks, you know, the, a plane, is a bit tricky. It is. But basically this gadget works on any hydrocarbon fuel, mm -hmm. which means whatever, whether it's uh, jet fuel, <coughs> paraffin, kerosene, diesel, whatever it is. Okay, and any engine then that burns this improves its combustion capability. Okay, and this is where we get the percentage by measuring the emissions before. Like for vehicle, it's very easy to measure the emissions. We use opacity test. Um, there's a meter that you put before, but the the, the effect is instant. Mm. If we have like your generator, I'm sure you've got generators here. If we come and we're willing to come and do it because we do POC, we will measure before. You get satisfied, your people, your engineers will certify the emissions at this in terms of uh, carbon dioxide per whatever it is. And we will install in 20 minutes when it starts running, you will see, first of all, less smoke, if it was smoking a lot, and you will see the reduction in the meter. And you can bring other experts and you'll get the same effect. So it's instantaneous mm -hmm. because it, the, the breakdown starts immediately, the device starts um, vibrating the bigger the tank the bigger the device if right. the, the tank is very big we put in more devices so what we are saying is that essentially emissions which would cause some kind of harm to the environment then would either be reduced or done away with completely we can do away with them completely okay. we reduce them significantly okay. the highest we've gotten was 95 mm -hmm. but we normally when you check what we we're giving out there we're saying 80%. Okay. Now, let, let's look at, let, let me just take the example of Kenya on carbon emissions because this is important. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is an area, 58% of emissions in Kenya are caused by vehicles. 58%. Mm -hmm. Now, one passenger car in Kenya, I'm talking about Kenya, will emit about one ton of carbon dioxide a year. So, sorry? One? One, 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 you like your personal mm. yes one ton one ton eh. equivalent mm -hmm. per year a whole year That's a lot. average That's a lot. for a truck it's about 4.5 tons now what is the biggest and the best way to sequester emissions particularly carbon dioxide it's trees, trees. vegetation mm. now one tree in a year will absorb about 25 kgs of carbon dioxide because what does it do? It takes Oxygen. that and releases oxygen. Uh, how big must the tree be? <laughs> uh, that's a full uh, grown, okay. of course. That's why I say on average. Mm. Okay. The bigger 25 the foliage. Kilos. Yes. Mm. Okay. The bigger the foliage, the better the 
mm. the absorption. It will go up to 40, but average is about 25. Mm. So if you talk about one ton per car, per year, mm. one tree, 25 kg per year, how many trees do you need? 50 for one car. 50 trees to then be able to absorb to this offset. One person. Offset this, oh, okay. Or one person car. Mm. One person car, 50 trees. Yes. Got mm. it. Okay. Now, if you're talking about a track, then you're talking about three or four times that. Okay. Because you're talking about 4.5 tons per year. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, on average, again, acreage, how many trees can you have full grown trees in an acre? Worldwide is between 40 and 100 trees. So how many acres would you need per car to be able to, to offset the emissions that come up? You know, suddenly this billion tree project that the president has is beginning to make sense. Yes. <laughs> no, seriously. Yes. So I'm beginning to think, is that arithmetic millions won't do. Mm. Hundreds of millions definitely won't do. So billions, we may be able to start scratching the surface of this thing. Now, Kenya's coverage, and I don't have accurate data, um, but the last data that I saw, I think, was 2019. Coverage, forest coverage, was about 12 to 15 million acres. Okay. Yeah, about. Mm. I'm not, I'm not, please don't quote me because I don't have... No, no, we're not, we're not quoting you, but even the percentage of coverage is around that range in terms of percentage. Yes. Forest cover in this country, in fact, it's below that. It's below. Our forest cover is actually not it's, good. It's, it's, it's not, not good. It's not 10%. It's, no, it's less than 10%. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Now, we look at... How many cars do we have on Kenyan roads right now? I would say in the region north of 5 million. There are many. North of 5 million. Let's take. Hmm. Yeah? So if I take an average 5 million and I say I need 50 trees to offset the emissions from each car, then you can see how the many entire, trees yeah, The need. entire country will be a forest. We need about 20 to 30 million acres coverage. Hmm. We have a coverage of about 12 to 15 million. So this is where we come in. And we say, if we are able to reduce the emissions by, let's say, as we say, 80%, because it's proven, we, instead of needing 20 million acres coverage, we need 10 million, which means Kenya can become carbon, I mean, we can become uh, uh, positive. We can actually achieve the COP26 um, agreement that we signed up to, which is the goals of 2030. I think we, I don't have the full details per se because, I'm, as I said, I'm not an expert on carbon emissions. Or so, But at the same time, if we then become, we reduce that much, on the world stage, we can then start trading in carbon, which is why the president signed the carbon trade uh, act, I think it's going to come into effect soon. So we are saying we are providing technology to reduce emissions. And we're just talking about the effect on the environment. We're not even talking about the effect on the health of people. Because a lot of infants die because of respiratory problems. And that is caused by emissions. 58% of those are caused by cars. We are saying we will reduce this by up to 80%. Proven. We've tested, we've gotten accommodation letters, not just from, I mean, cabs have tested, Ministry of Transport has done that, public sector bodies have done that, private sector companies are using it. Uh, has the has only never tested? Uh, that has been done under cabs. Kenya Kebs standardizes. Yes. Has Nema done some tests to show that these things that we are talking about are indeed correct? Now, we've not done with Nema. Reductions in, in, in carbon emissions in terms of the harm to the environment and reductions to the harm to the environment. That's ongoing, but we've done with the, mini, the Mechanical Engineer Ministry of Transport, mm -hmm. which certified, and we have letters to the effect. Mm -hmm. So, and when we talk about private sector companies, I've mentioned them. They have tested themselves, they are certified, they are mm. satisfied, and they have given us commendation letters. The only thing is that there's a cost to this. And of course, in any society, there's always a resistance to change yeah. and trust, which is what we're building up, which is what we're actually working towards. And uh, we're looking to have a few big um, companies to be able to adopt this 
yeah, then they become the leaders to be able to champion this because a lot of tree, tree planting is being done. But as I've said, trees are the best sinks for carbon emissions, mm. the best. But to be able to achieve significant reduction and to sequester the, the carbons, I mean, the emissions that are done, you need a lot of you trees. You need too many trees. Mm. Yeah, exactly. You said this is patented technology, proprietary technology from Italy. Italy. Is there any other similar technology that's being deployed, that's being used elsewhere? Not yet, because it's fairly new. But of course, because it's a patent, means the other people who will do it will be paying royalty to the Italian company. Okay. So they will be generic, basically. This what's, is the original. What's the Italian company? Uh, Supertech. We, we, we t it trades under Supertech, but the company is ES something SRL. You know, Italian name, I can't pronounce it. Uh, okay. Have they deployed it elsewhere? In Europe. the markets, in Europe, in, in Italy itself? Across the EU, mm -hmm. uh, very big in Brazil. Uh, so the, the, in Africa, several countries. We have been given opportunity um, that if we reach a mark of 50,000 deployed pieces, they will set up the factory for manufacturing these devices for Africa and Kenya. How many devices? 50,000. Uh, and that we should be able to achieve. I mean, I look at the public sector, for example, how many cars are in the public sector when you talk about parastatals and yes, government, government? Maybe is. two, three hundred thousand. Yes, if many. we were just to start off with that, the 50,000 is a very small number. Okay. No, it is small because you, my mind went to the disciplined forces. Yeah. And my mind went Absolutely. to the police. different services. Yeah, p places where, where they buy large numbers of cars. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. State house. And and big cars, <laughs> right? <laughs> and those huge guys. Like so you talk <laughs> about cost being. <laughs> you talk about cost being a challenge. What's the cost of this? Because I imagine okay. that if we're talking about emissions on a global scale, and everybody's been drumming this message over and over and over again, that you know it's uh, something that everybody would rush to buy. But then one thing that would preclude that would be the cost of the thing. So, all right. L let me first talk about. Um, this device comes in various sizes. It depends on the size of the tank. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the smallest device will cost about 35000 I remember it's a one-off. Mm -hmm. For life? Uh, no. What's the not. lifespan of the, of the gadget? Eight to ten years. Mm -hmm. But we give a warranty of five years. On the same vehicle? This, you no. You, you, you can actually yeah. move off, yeah. move it into uh -huh. another vehicle. Okay. And it's still as effective. Okay. So we're talking about the smallest, about 35000 Kenya shillings, one-off. But they, the ones we've done, the ROI, you return your investment in the worst has been six months, which is one of the best. Because the savings that you have on fuel is so effective that for big trucks, they do it in less than two months. But this is what is funny. I mean, every time the biggest problem is actually change. Second biggest problem is cost. Because we, have, we are in a position where there are parties, financial institutions that are saying, if people are ready to adopt, we'll finance it as long as they agree on, we share profit on the savings. Uh, the adoption is just because there's a resistance to change. Uh, there's a lot of other things underlying. I mean, one of the things that happens is when we put in this, recently, we put in another company, and the first thing when we left after one week, they told us the device has affected a vehicle, it's not running. Mm -hmm. uh, so we go and remove it and we say now run it still the car had a problem then the driver comes and tells us this car has had a pump problem for the last four months <laughs> <laughs> but it was part of the resistance the pushback yeah because what it does is we were monitoring the usage and we're giving you data some people don't like being monitored so what they do is they fight back so that's another challenge that we have but in terms of adoption, in terms of testing, there's a lot of everybody that we've dealt with has been very positive. They're all out. We're hoping that the change can be adopted and taken up quickly. For a truck, for example, that normally has a tank of about 200 to 400 liters, we're talking about a one-off cost of 75,000. That's like the biggest. If you go to a generator that has got a big tank, like hosp I mean, hospitals and um, maybe even here you've got an outside tank, then we might want to put in two or three devices and put in an agitator to do that. So then you'll be talking maybe 100, 150,000 because you have two devices. So the highest is 75,000 shillings. 
and you've got a five-year warranty, you can transfer it from one engine, one tank to another. It will have the same effect, one vehicle to another. And it's got a lifespan of eight to ten years. Peter, the cost is not the issue then. 75,000 shillings for somebody who's running round-the-clock operations, say on a generator or on a truck, it's not much. And make back your money in a month or two. Yeah, yeah. let's even say you go to six months, yeah. right? It's not much. It's not even six months. So what is this other barrier Yes. that you're facing? Because it cannot be the cost. The biggest barrier. And it cannot also be the staff. Because if, if the management of the company sees the sense and they can see the direct change of their bottom line, everybody will fall in line. Now, I'm just sharing with you the feedback mm -hmm. and the pushback we've had. So we did for two Matatu circles, and I'll mention them. And the director of one sat with us. We were giving him our readings of 19% savings on fuel. He had 21. And we said no. Um, our because he was recording manually. Our device was giving us 19%. Uh, he's got about 400 vehicles. Yeah. Mm -hmm the minibuses mm. and when we now push for deployment and told him we'll give you a discount because of volumes and he said i can't afford it despite the fact that the savings would have been within maybe two months mm. second part couldn't afford because of he's looking at 400 at a go mm. um but we were willing to do lease as well okay. pay as you go and we even have offered we say the savings you get we take 50%, you keep 50% for the first one year. And then after that, you enjoy for the next nine years. So the biggest challenge is resistance change. So I agree with you, it's not cost, but it's also a factor. Mm. But the main, main challenge is resistance to change. In terms of proven efficacy, that we've done, and anybody who comes, we tell them, don't pay first. Mm. Let's do it for you. Be happy, then talk to us. Uh, we are doing a lot of that, yes, but the adoption is still slow mm. but because it's fairly new. Okay. Yeah. I, I see probably an issue of concern, safety concern, that yes, this gadget could be doing this thing. It's just the same way people really fear that thing of telling them, I will put this in your fuel tank and you will see your car will operate better and you're thinking, yeah, 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 for the first yeah, yeah. one month and then my engine will knock on the third year, right? How do you address that? Because that's a huge concern. How do you address the concern that this thing is not harmful to my vehicle, to my engine, and then later to the environment? Now, we have been talking to people, and the only way, because this is a fairly new product in Kenya, so we don't have historical data to say nothing has gone wrong in Kenya, but we're getting data from Italy, from Brazil, where the deployment has been heavy. But at the same time, we have certification, not just from Kenyan authorities, but from the EU that has proven that this device is safe to use. And these are experts who test this, and they have various criteria that they use to test. So that's what we use to be able to assure people. And then we give a guarantee, we give a warranty. And one of the things that SafeTrack does as well, we, do, we deploy a lot of gadgets uh, in vehicles, in, in engines, in machines, and so on. Whenever something goes wrong, we normally take it up because we've got uh, professional indemnity insurance. Mm. There's once uh, one of our guys went to install a simple AI camera in a new Range Rover, and I don't know what he did. He, have, he reset the program. And the vehicle couldn't start. We had to put it on a low loader from Mombasa, brought it back to Nairobi. I was like, I'm going to have to pay for this. And we sorted it out. So we do give those guarantees. You know, one of the things that is interesting about change, yeah? it's not that what we refer to as a resistance to change is our reaction to something we don't understand. Or we have questions about and the questions we have haven't been fully responded to to our satisfaction or when it is explained to us it's not explained to us in a way that would resonate with us and that would make it easier for us to accept because for many people the car is already functioning i can see it functioning it moves mm -hmm. and then you're saying this thing which vibrates is going to reduce 
the fuel is up and yeah and your name is not the manufacturer of the vehicle yes. your name is not a big petroleum company yeah, but you're uh, telling me the price uh, this thing is i put it in my tank <laughs> and then it's going to it <laughs> must, uh, yes. then i give you money <laughs> and then i give you money to, uh, you, you, I, know, I you know i'm beginning to suspect that charles <laughs> needs we we must we must put it in your vehicle but i understand what you're saying yes so what one of the things that we we're trying to do we've gone out there and we're trying to we have a lot of presentations that we're doing to educate groups on how this works mm -hmm. and we're demystifying by going first of all for people that are leaders you know when certain people do something others tend to follow mm -hmm. and to achieve that we're doing it through we like we have explained how it works we explain what it will do but the test of the pudding is in the eating. Let's yes. do a POC. So we do a POC, a proof of concept. And that's how we've been able to, we've got quite a lot of sign-ups, mm. um, but yep. it's not as fast as we would like it to You be. have an R&D division. Huh? Okay. Perhaps um, you need to consider everything you're doing is fine, but there's always the little concept of what we call formative work. Formative work involves understanding what it is that people actually desire what they understand about they understand about what you're telling them and what it is they would find acceptable because nobody is going to refuse to reduce the cost of of of, of, mm -hmm. of, of whatever it is they spend on fuel no one will refuse so it isn't the reduction of the are declining now i cannot sit here and claim to understand what it is We've talked about the fear of the unknown and the reaction to it, but since you have an R&D department, that information will tell you what it is that people are afraid of because they are afraid. It, it, mm. it, 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 it's not anything else. Mm. Because imagine someone tells you, like I was told <laughs> for the first time, yeah. coming from the airport, that this vehicle I'm on uses gas. I told <laughs> the guy to stop. <laughs> Not today. Together. I was looking at the gas cylinder in my house and I'm seeing, I was seeing this. Me, I knew this car was going to explode. <laughs> Peter, was you. <laughs> People are asking, <laughs> where can they get more information about this? Do you have a website? Do you have a platform where they can research? Because they're saying, okay, yeah, 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 we want information based on research, not buzzwords. Not. Um, and, we, what's the, and what's the name of this gadget? Uh, Supertech. We are going to. What we've done. Mm. We have not done what we call an official launch. We've just been doing marketing direct door to door. Uh, we are prepared collateral, mm. and it's going to we we're going to have it on the website. We're going to have an What's the website? Uh, www.safetrack.co.ke. Safetrack.co.ke. Yeah, it's not it on. Mm. A lot of other products are neat. But this is not it on because we're preparing the animated videos and, and all the other material. The next big thing. Yeah, absolutely. Peter Echessa, thank you very much for joining us. He's a founder, CEO of Borderless Tracking and Safe Track Limited. Thank you for tuning in to Kenya's Biggest Conversation today. Tomorrow is Thursday. We'll be here, God willing. It's 10 a.m. Have a lovely day. Well, I'm Dennis Aceto. Deputy President Rikath Gishag is expected to announce new measures the government will take to combat the sale and consumption of illicit alcohol in the country. Deputy Gishaga will address the media on the said far-reaching measures from his current residence in Karen any time from now. Now, Gishagwa has been leading a spirited fight against drug abuse, especially the sale of illicit brew in the Mount Kenya region, where scores have perished. Sambur Governor Jonathan Lelelit has accused the Directorate of Criminal Investigations of harassing political leaders by issuing regular summons against them. The governor spoke after answering DCI summons on the ongoing sergeant banditry in the county. Governor Lelelit had been summoned for a second time in one month by officers from the DCI Rift Valley region to shed light into the ongoing incident of banditry in Samburu County. His time with the DCI lasted 10 minutes and he reportedly signed crucial documents provided by the investigators before leaving. The 70-year-old man who was being sought after killing his nephew Monday in Togonyam, where East Kirinyaga County, 
has been found dead. According to his relatives, Patrick Gishobi was found hanging from a tree Tuesday evening by people who had gone to look for grass for their cattle. Gishobi killed in four-year-old Ian Mwendia after they arrived home Monday at around 5 p.m. from a drinking spree in the local village. The 70-year-old stabbed Mwendia with a kitchen knife after a 